chance to meet Kevin Smith, Silent Bob, and all those terrible Jane Silent Bob type pictures, man. You're listening to Drop the Mic, the only podcast that I listen to that I'm not a part of. Every podcast I listen to, I usually talk on it, but not fucking Drop the Mic. That's where I'm like, let me hear what the boys have to say. And now we drop the mic. Hey everybody, welcome back to your humble San Diego podcast. We are Drop the Mic and uh, I am Wesley Swanson. Alongside me tonight is Chris Pollock for the best of 2022. What's up, man? What's up? How many years has this been? That we've been... Is this our sixth year doing the best of? I think it is. Wow. Six years. Wow. Wow. These are always a really fun show because we get to kind of talk about, you know, what we watched and what was what was really good this year, maybe what was bad this year, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all that. But, yeah, it's, it's, we've been doing this a while. It's been a long time. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, dude. Yeah, I'm, I'm always happy to be here. This is one of my favorite episodes of the year. It's the most relaxed. Yeah, because I don't have to spend my week doing nothing but research. Yeah. We just kind of dive into it and uh, and give our raw kind of feelings yeah. on stuff. Yeah, I'm excited. Got a list of some good some good flicks that I saw, and I'm sure uh, you and I are going to be in agreement on most of them. Yeah, because I, I think I think you did see most of them. I have, with the exception of a couple. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing there's a couple that I was able to see. One of them kind of came and went, so I'd, I'd be surprised if you had if you managed to see that one. But we'll see. So, pop culture news. I didn't really see much this week. I have nothing for you. Nothing? This week was pretty busy, and I haven't really been paying attention to a lot of stuff. All right, so we'll hit that fast-forward button. And now it's time for the weekly recommendations. Yes. Uh, I know I recommended it two years ago. This is before, like pre-COVID, pre-pandemic stuff, but Sherman's Showcase. Oh, yeah. On uh, on IFC, which I think you can hook up on AMC Plus, right? Yes. Uh, really funny. It's kind of like a, a fake uh, variety show, kind of like a fake Soul Train show. Okay. Uh, but the two guys who created it, Dial Riddle and uh, Bashir Salahud, really funny. They play multiple roles in uh, in the show. There's a bunch of fake songs because, like I said, it's like a fake Soul Train. So there's you know performances, and half the time, like these two guys are in costume, dressed up as whomever, uh, performing a song. Mm-hmm. And it's just really funny. Uh, I really like it a lot. They have, they've had two seasons with about six episodes apiece, and then there was in between those seasons during the the pandemic they had like a black history month special in july oh okay yeah that's an hour long episode that's really funny so you should be able to to hook those up on uh either ifc or amc plus something something like that they also got another show on on hbo max called Southside, mm-hmm. which is pretty funny i've been watching i've been watching that and really enjoyed that and they both have supporting roles in that so they're not the the main characters but it's really funny I highly recommend Sherman Showcase. And they're always doing like weird stuff on that show. They have like a an homage to Suspiria on one episode. One episode, like half of it is an homage to the prestige. Oh wow. There was like one episode where they did it was almost like a fake streaming service. It was like Sherman Streaming Service, something like that. I can't remember the exact name of it. But uh he like gives a review of Mulholland Drive. And it just someone that keeps hitting like the fast forward button, so you're just getting like these random bits of information from Mulholland Drive, <laughs> and then he like ends it. And he's like, and then she kills herself. It's a weird movie. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's a funny show. I like it a lot. So I, I highly suggest checking out Sherman Showcase and check out Southside too because it's pretty funny. And then my second is, you know what time of year it is. You know we're coming up on the new year. So you know what I'm about to recommend. Mm-hmm. Get in on that 48-hour sci-fi channel marathon of The Twilight Zone. 
But tune in to Sci-Fi. It's going to start probably 6 a.m. Saturday morning on New Year's Eve, and it's going to go until probably about 6 a.m. on uh, the 2nd. Check it out. Love that show. Never never miss the, uh, the marathon. I'll just turn on the TV and leave it on for however long I'm around. However many episodes I get to catch before I go to work. As soon as I come home from work, it's going to go right back on, and I'm going to watch however many episodes I can before I got to go to bed. The Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone. Get in on it. That's insane. You know what's insane to me is that it does not feel like it's been a year since we were talking, since you were plugging this the last time. Time goes so fast, dude. It feels like a couple months ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I was like, oh shit, it really is. It's already that time again. We're at the hotel doing the record. I remember like coming down to the hotel for the first time to talk about uh, raising Arizona. I'm mm-hmm. thinking that was back in March, man. That was like nine months ago. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> gonna gonna start a new year here in a couple of days. Yeah. Exciting stuff. I hope. I hope. Better. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> little by little. Where those masks, people? COVID shouldn't be a thing three years later. It, it still is. Okay. For me this week, um, the only new thing that I think I've watched that I don't want to spoil, I guess. This is a tough one because... So I have watched stuff, but films. So I'm going to do a TV show uh, or a mini series. The uh, Showtime uh, Let the Right One In. Oh, yeah. It's good, right? Yeah. Yes. I'm about halfway through it right now. I've, I've really enjoyed it. And Nick Stahl, man. Nick yeah. Stahl. Finally. Pops up, man. He's good on it. Yeah. He's good on it. As is, you know, uh, Damien Bashir and um, uh, Grace Gummer is really good on it. But yeah, I was, I was pleasantly surprised to see Nick Stahl like, pop up and he's, he's good on the show. Check that out on Showtime. Yeah. Right now. It's, it's following the beats of the movie, but because it's a, a long-form series... You, you can know, expand. It, it, yeah, yeah, it does its own thing. But yeah, yeah a lot of the, the same beats in the film are there. Do you... Um, expanding a little bit on this, what are your thoughts on the... So, do you like the American remake? And, I do, very do much. You, do you like the original? Yeah, the original is great. And the Matt Reeves remake that's... Jesus, it might be 10, 12 years old now, mm-hmm. is really fucking good, too. Uh, uh, Chloe Grace Moretz is great in it as is Richard Jenkins and Cody Smith uh, McPhee it's all really good Uh, that shot of when Richard Jenkins is in the car Mm -hmm. and gets gets kind of like caught basically and he's trying to to drive and it's just that static shot from the back seat you can see him like crash and then flip over the car it's amazing. It's good. Matt Reeves, we'll be talking about him a little bit I'm tonight. sure that we will touch on him tonight. <laughs> All right. So then that'll move us into uh, our likes and dislikes for 2022. That was your only rec? That was my only rec. Okay. All right. So you, you start us off, man. Why don't we start with the movie that both you and I just watched? Okay. Because I saw it yesterday morning. And you saw it when? Uh, what's today again? Today's Thursday. Uh, we I saw it. Um, oh, Monday. Monday. Okay. Monday night. Okay. So, the movie that we're talking about is The Whale. Mm-hmm. Just came out. I had no idea it was just out until you and I were hanging out last week, and Joel had texted me and said he he had just watched it, and really he he, he said he was shook. Yeah. Like by the end of it. And I was like, man, that, that sounds good. I didn't know it was out, but, you know, I looked looked around and then saw where it was playing. And yesterday was my first day off since the last time that you and I hung out last week. And I managed to go down and watch it early show. And, yeah, by the end, I texted him. I said, man, you weren't kidding because I was not expecting that movie to hit me as hard as it did. That That final scene, that climax scene is incredible Mm -hmm. just the acting and the emotion between Brendan Fraser and and Sadie Sink shout out to to Sadie Sink for you know because she's obviously known for Stranger Things Mm -hmm. and so to make a uh, this kind of turn it was just 
man, she has some real like serious acting chops. Yeah. And I was very, very impressed with her performance in this. She is very good. Uh, Hong Chow, Mm -hmm. who plays his friend slash nurse. Yeah. And then you find out later, like kind of she's a bit closer to him for another reason. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. We didn't say. We just kind of jumped in. Do we want to say spoiler alert for these movies? Some of these are still out, still playing. What Some you, of these are older. What do you think? Should we keep it close to the chest? I'll be nice. The movies that are still out, I'll keep close to the chest. Uh, and I don't like spoiling stuff that I know you haven't seen. Mm-hmm. The Whale literally just came out probably on Christmas. At least everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, right. I'll be careful what I say about that. Everything else on this list is kind of fair game as far as I'm concerned. It's it's based on a play, which makes mm-hmm. sense because it does not leave that uh, okay. that apartment. Very, no. You no. know, and one or two times it does. It's actually just more of a, a dream sequence or a memory. Flashback, something, yeah. Yeah, yeah but... I, I want to go back to talking about Hong Chao because she's fantastic in it. This is the second movie this year that she's fucking incredible in. Mm-hmm. The first is The Menu. Mm-hmm. I have um, not seen it yet. We will talk about it a little bit later. But she's very good in The Menu as well. Uh, more sinister in that. Okay. But she's incredible here as as uh, Fraser's friend and his, his nurse. And I was really impressed with... with what she was doing in the film as well. Oh, yeah. And Frasier is great. I know that we were kind of talking about him last week. Um, is he on a comeback? Who knows? He was around still, popping up from time to time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, supposedly this is kind of like a big comeback role for him, even though he's had a few other pretty decent roles in the last few years. But... So impressed with with him and uh, what he does in this movie, this this performance. I think he's still a front runner for like a best actor at the Academy Awards, and I can see why. I don't I don't know if I've seen another uh, performance by a lead actor this year that has been as good as this one. I think I would one hundred percent agree with you. There's something very like. Um special about this one Mm -hmm. and uh definitely nothing like it has come out this year for sure it's like in a you know it's a category of its own right now yeah yeah good darren aronofsky movie since his last one was not great uh mother yeah i thought you said it was okay it's okay but it's just, it's so, like, weird and kind of up its own ass mm-hmm. at, at mm-hmm. some points. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I, I, it wasn't well received. Okay. And I can see why. But, I mean, I don't know how how far you've dug as far as critics and fans talking about The Whale. But The Whale's a very polarizing movie for people, too, right now. Yeah. And is, is it the prosthetics? No, I don't. I just think everybody's lo- lo- okay. People's gripes with the film. It seems they they're saying that the the writing was bad, and that Frasier deserved better. Is what I've been reading. Really, over and over again. Really? That Frasier is amazing, but he cannot save the movie itself. Are these like like major critics? Yes. Okay. Like the Guardian and all this. Really? Pa- yes. Wow. Yes. <laughs> wow. Then I have to ask, like. What movie did you and I see? Because you and I and Joel, like, you texted me last week, like, you know, he said he had a, a couple of gripes with it, which is fine, but he was like, man, that's that's an incredible performance. That's a good movie. And he says, you know, it left him shook at the end, as it did me. I was very emotional by the end of it. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. I wasn't even, I was still processing the movie when I was walking out of it. Mm. I couldn't. I didn't even say anything. Mm-hmm. I had no thoughts. I was still sitting on it. But but yeah, um, I feel like Arnofsky has that rare gift of doing that to people where... Where just, he's polarizing no matter what? 
Yeah, doesn't matter what it is. And I think it just that's just something that he does to people as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but I do agree with you that it's interesting that all of these people that I've read, major critics, are saying the same thing, but then we went and, and we watched it and, and were able to accept it. But but uh, at the same time, I don't think that you you and I and Joel are... Um, regular moviegoers mm -hmm. you know like we, we're able to read between the lines and we know especially like a24 type stuff what we're getting into as opposed to other people maybe mm -hmm. not so much you know it does the 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 whale does feel very much like a kind of the way it's set up and shot and everything it is kind of still like a play mm -hmm. so maybe that's what people didn't like and it's in that that academy ratio of the 133 exactly you know, where you have the the black bars on the sides mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which uh didn't the lighthouse do that yeah so? the lighthouse shot like that and another movie that we're going to talk tonight changes aspect ratios a lot throughout and uh, i noticed when i was watching it and really really dug but back to the whale yeah it's it can seem very stagey, but unlike some movies that are, are um, you know, play the screen, mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, you basically just film the play. This felt like a movie. It just happens to take place in a single location. Yeah. I think the people who didn't like the movie or what Aronofsky did just had their bars set way too high for mm -hmm. what was supposed to be a smaller a contained film mm -hmm. they wanted they were expecting something else what it, what what that was i don't know but you understand what i'm saying yeah. right? but yes go see the whale ladies and gentlemen if you haven't already and if you you're able to think outside the box and you like kind of unorthodox movies go check it out go support darren aronofsky and uh, brendan fraser i i highly recommend it i told you yesterday it was easily like a top five movie for me and maybe, maybe I'll have to sit down and watch it again and see if it still hits me. But, I mean, that climax scene, like, hits me really hard. And I haven't had a, a movie do that to me in a while. And I don't want to spoil anything. I'll tell you off air what that climax scene reminded me of. Okay. Which is another movie that is an older film but hit me pretty hard every single time I would watch it when they would get to this one scene. So re definitely remind me. I don't want to forget telling you about that, but I'm afraid if I say it on air, it's going to give away too much, too much. Yeah. For, yeah, especially talking about the whale. That's super fresh for everyone. Yeah. Because that's... it's less than a week old right now. Mm -hmm. As far as, as far as I know, I'll tell you this. Um, last time I checked, it's got a, 65 on run which is well if you say there's a lot of critics that mm -hmm. were not not down with it then that probably makes sense i'm going to be honest and and say that i saw this the the preview night thursday night uh the new scream scream was scream five technically yes. uh and you just watched this the other night for the very first time correct Yep, because i hadn't seen it but i tried I told you last week before we were doing Go, or maybe before we were actually on air in mm -hmm. Go, that I'm trying to kind of make that sprint to the finish line because I knew that there was a handful of movies that you had seen that I had yet to see. Yes. So I Scream was on that list, and I figured, okay, if I can make it, if I can get the time to do it, I will. I'll try to watch it. And yeah, watched it and was pleasantly surprised how much I enjoyed it. That makes me so happy, dude. When you sent me that text and you said that <laughs> Scream was legit, I was all, hell yeah. Because I was very nervous. And I was just <laughs> waiting for that time, the time when you finally got to watch it and to, to kind of pick your brain about your thoughts. Um, and I do I, have thoughts. And I'm, uh, I'm just glad. And I'm glad you now you can watch the... You don't have to worry about spoiling anything for yourself with, you know, the next one that's coming out in the inevitable trailer and teaser. Yeah, I haven't watched that because I hadn't seen this one. And I did know that Nev Campbell wasn't returning for six. Yes. I did know that, which is unfortunate because she's always been if the that heart is actually and face true. of the franchise. Mm -hmm. 
if I'm hoping it's not, but I think it came down to like a mm -hmm. money issue, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. and guys, come on, she's <laughs> she's the the final girl. Like, pay her what pay her what she's worth. Pay her the money. So that bums me out. But yeah, uh, so let's let's talk scream for a bit. Um, I wanted to give a big shout out to uh, Jenna Ortega. And who's great in another movie that I'm sure you and I are going to talk about in, yeah, in a yeah, few here. Yes, absolutely. Um, fuck, I lost my thought. Sorry. Uh, Jenna Ortega and Melissa Barrera are very, very good yeah. as the some of the new cast. Can we talk about this movie for real? Because it's like a year old right now, right? Yeah, yeah. So we can spoil it? Some, somewhat, yeah, that's fine, I think. It's been out. It's streaming now on Showtime. Yeah, you know. So, go. Let's go. Well, I mean, they're they're sisters mm -hmm. in the in the film. Uh, they, they, here's a big spoiler for you right now. So, if you don't want to hear what we're going to talk about for this, for the uh, the scream from earlier this year, put on pause or skip skip a beat, whatever you have to do. But yes, please. So they're the daughters. Of Skeet Ulrich's character. Mm -hmm. Billy Loomis. Of Billy Loomis. Who I'm pretty sure got de-aged because he, he pops up like kind of in a... He looks, yeah. Not he, necessarily a flashback, but uh, be, uh, some psychotic episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, which is very cool. But yeah, they do make him look like the Billy from the original, from yeah. the 96. Even, like at the end of the movie, too, because he's like got the blood on his face and his shirt. Yes. Like he, like he does when uh, at, during the climax of the original Scream. He's um, He does a very good job. It was fun to see him back. I wasn't expecting them to go that route, but I was glad that they did because it leaves um, room for more things like this, mm -hmm. maybe in the next one. There's a lot of speculation of, of with Stu. The, the climax of this movie takes place at Stu's house. Yes. Which was funny because you don't really realize it until kind of it's mentioned and then you kind of see the outside and then when they're in the kitchen, the kitchen is all familiar and yep. there's a couple yep. of, of callbacks to the original one with, you know, one of the characters watching watching TV on the couch, mm -hmm. watching the horror movie, watching the original stab mm -hmm. on the couch and not knowing that the killer is behind her. Who is... Uh the niece of, of Randy Meeks. That's another thing I really liked about it was they brought back Madarazzo Mad uh, mm -hmm. as as a sister in like a, a cameo. Yep, yep. Fucking Jamie Kennedy. His little, the <laughs> shrine, the little, mm -hmm. the stuff that they have for him. It was pretty rad to see. <laughs> you, know, you know who the niece was? I was trying to like figure out, because she looked familiar. Uh, Yellow Jackets? Yeah, she's, she's Tawny Cypress's younger version on Yellow Jackets. I was like watching the movie saying, like, she looks so familiar. Who yeah. is that? Who do I and know then from? Uh -huh. about three quarters of the way through, I was like, oh, she's the younger version of Tawny Cypress's character on Yellow Jackets. Which is coming back soon, I hope. It's coming back, and it got uh, early greenlit for a third season. Awesome, because apparently they want to do five seasons, so <laughs> don't leave me hanging halfway through. No, that's like one of my favorite shows right now. Mm. So let let them fucking finish it, guys. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I had a real beef with something, but that's because I thought he was very good in the movie. Our cat. I was really sad when, uh, when he bought it. I know that they kind of faked out uh courtney cox in the last one in scream four like she was gonna be yeah the one to get killed and then she survives but uh when arquette gets buys the farm in this i was really upset because he's very good yeah he's in his few scenes up until that point arguably maybe some of the best work he's done for the franchise yeah. in this new one yeah hands down and yeah to see him even though he goes out in a very cool way it's a cool death it's just you, you're. You, they took away that kind of Trinity effect mm -hmm. by eliminating um, Dewey, and it was just, uh, yeah, like you said, I was not <laughs> expecting that either. Um, but also, I can see, you know, th there has to be stakes mm -hmm. 
You know, yeah. like when you're trying to do something in a franchise, there has to be, you don't want to end up doing like this formula thing the way that the Fast and the Furious does. Yeah. Going back to your point, I was upset over it, but I understood. Yeah, you understand. I wasn't I wasn't happy because like I said he's always been one of the the best parts of the films. He's always kind of provided the comic relief either knowingly or unknowingly. I wanted to say before I forget this, did you notice the um super vague um Easter egg in his tra- is it a trailer that he lives in? Yeah. Did you notice anything weird inside? Anything that you can remember? Jog my memory. When we first meet Dewey's character again in this new, in Scream uh, 5, when he gets up to make his coffee, he walks to the to his kitchen. If you pay attention, I think it might be like in the uh, upper right-hand side. There's a, there's a shot, the camera pans, and you can see Tatum's um, ashes, which is his, mm-hmm. his, his sister, Rose McGowan's character from the original film. And I just wonder how many people actually notice that because they never reference it. They mm-hmm. don't say anything. It's just there. And it's good that the camera like doesn't linger on it and mm-hmm. it's saying like, here, look at this. This is important. Yeah, shoving it down your yeah. throat or anything. Yeah, but just it's... a little detail that if you're paying attention, as I probably wasn't. It's <laughs> because okay. Because I didn't see it. Yeah, no, it's okay. Most people that I ask, they didn't notice that yeah. either until they go, they'll go back and look for it because of me. Maybe I'll go back and, and rewatch it. Which is cool, though. Um, Yeah, it's a fine movie. Here's the one thing that really upset me about it. Was Marley Shelton. Oh, Who was one of the best parts of 4. And they even referenced, like, the Lemon Squares again. Yeah. Which was a funny bit in in number 4. With uh, Wes, her son. Yeah. Right. And I felt like she didn't have a whole lot to do in the film. She was just kind of there. And then she dies. Like, f- like body, body count, yeah. Stuff like uh, fodder, yeah, for the movie. Yeah, I, I was, I was, I remember when you saw it. I was like, hey, did they bring back Marley Shelton because she was one of what I thought was the best newer characters in in the fourth, and she had survived the fourth, and was it was a lot of fun in that movie. And I asked you if she was back, and you said, yeah. And I was like, all right, cool. And then when I was watching it, I was like, oh, she's not really doing a whole lot. Maybe she'll, you know have a bigger part and then she gets killed maybe you know half hour 40 minutes into the end of the movie yeah and that bummed me out because i thought she deserved better honestly and i don't know if i told you this but when when we were following this movie's production and everything i really thought that marley sheldon was going to be one of the killers Mm -hmm. and then she wasn't (laughs) um but i mean you know they kill her her and her son Within minutes of each other. The, I mean, it's the the killings in the movie are pretty brutal, but the the her son Wes, which I'm assuming is a a homage, an homage to yeah. Wes Craven. Like his kill was brutal because he gets that knife like right through the neck, but mm-hmm. it's like just under the skin. Where there's literally like nothing he can do. Yeah, he's just still alive, just there. <clears throat> crazy yeah brutal but i i really enjoyed it and i told you i i had a chance to go back and revisit the fourth one which i was always kind of meh on mm-hmm. the first time but the second time i watched the fourth one i enjoyed it a lot more i'm glad i'm glad so that's that's why i was looking forward to this one and i know it wasn't wes craven because he has passed away but the radio silence guys were very good yeah and so, they're doing the next one too, right? Yeah, that's okay. the the team's back. Okay, for this one, and tomorrow weavings coming back to, for this next. <laughs> oh, really? One. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Watch Ready or Not because Ready or Not's fantastic. It it's, is. It's so much fun. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, so it's safe to say that you're excited for this next one. Then you're you're going. Well, once you're, I see a trailer, sure. Doing, yeah, <laughs> I'll watch a trailer tomorrow. <laughs> now that now that I've finally watched this one, they're gonna be in. Uh, in New York, that's I remember seeing that like in the, the the headline for the trailer, which is it's breaking new ground because as far as I remember, every movie has taken place in in Woodsboro, right? Parts at least because the third one takes place in Hollywood. Oh, that's right, right? But some parts of it take place in Woodsboro, where she's remember, hiding, right? and then there's they go to the movie sets. I guess, I guess, or like at the very end, wherever she's kind of living off the grid. 
Maybe that isn't Woodsboro, so I could be wrong on that. The third one's trash. That's what I was gonna say. We don't even talk about that. Yeah, don't beat up on me if I can't remember the fine details of the third Scream movie. I just know that most of it takes place in Hollywood. One, two, four, (laughs) and five. If you haven't watched it, uh, I believe it's streaming right now on Showtime. It should be available on Paramount Plus if you're a streamer type. But check it out. You know, um, I've always been a big fan of of Ghostface and Roger Jackson. His voice is fucking yeah, ph- always phenomenal. And the the quips, the one liners, that's what makes it for me. Yeah, and he is so brutal and um, unnerving in this new one. And the circle back to your first initial thought on the movie when we, were, when we uh, started this. Jenna Ortega, that f- that first scene oh. is so good. And she's incredible in it. She's got that X factor. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but yeah. No. She's fun. And I thought that she was going to pull the Drew Barrymore. Mm-hmm. The way that that first scene is set up and ends. I'm like, oh, she's so that's it for her, right? Uh, well, yeah, most of the franchise, <laughs> that's what happens is that's the iconic. They yeah, open up the opening kill and those people don't make it right. Yeah, it's a running theme. And f- a four kind of plays with it a little mm-hmm. bit m- more. But yeah, it's safe to say that we thought Jenna Ortega wasn't walking away. But yeah, but she does. She does, which is good because the rest of her stuff in the movies. Just as good. But that first scene, that opening scene is, is phenomenal. The elevated horror bit, everything <laughs> is it's awesome. There was some good some good bits on like Ryan Johnson and yeah. The Last Jedi. Yeah. There was uh some good bits on like the, the remake slash prequel or slash sequel, the requel that they were calling it. That's what's um the good meta humor. Mm-hmm. That's what Scream's all about, yeah. so I'm glad that they kept that alive. You yeah. know. Or they continue to do so. And when when the girls explaining it, like the legacy characters, and mm-hmm. everything, yeah, <laughs> it was it was it was a lot of fun. I didn't like roll my eyes at, at that because that's always kind of been, like you said, screams thing for being very meta. Yeah. Well, we brought him up already, so let's talk about the Batman. The Batman, which got a pretty good recommendation from you and I on one of the earlier episodes that we did this year. Of course, I think we've done our own episode yeah, you guys have. on it cj got mad at me on that one <laughs> <laughs> cj bro if you want to be on the show man you gotta like be active so let's talk about the batman for a bit i know that you've already done your your full length uh episode on it and you and i talked about it in a, an earlier episode this year it was one of our recommendations because it had just opened up and mm-hmm. you had just watched it i hadn't seen it all the way through yet but i had watched probably the first hour of it and I thought it was fantastic. It's very dark. It's very David Fincher. Um, I'm surprised it was PG-13, honestly. Yeah, there's some crazy stuff in there. Uh, I know that everyone always wants to talk about the Christopher Nolan movies being grounded in reality, but this one was even more so. Yeah, I think it does take it up to that next level. Which, um, if you don't like noir type stuff where you don't understand it I, I feel like there was a lot of people who who thought that this was too boring or too much dialogue or whatever it, it is long that's one of my beefs with it it felt like a movie that you could probably expand by another half hour and chop in two instead of just having one three hour film mm-hmm. probably expand it a little bit more and then cut it in half and maybe a good point to cut it in half is uh, when they catch the Riddler. Like just that scene in the coffee shop when they catch him, when they arrest him, cut it there, save the rest for the next film. But it it worked as a very good, like you said, a noir. It's a it's very much a detective movie. Mm-hmm. You know, it's always you know Batman is the world's greatest detective, and you never really see him do much of that. The it, movies always kind of tend yeah. to gloss over. Yeah, there's there's some stuff in The Dark Knight that feels a little bit more detective. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but there's just like passing stuff in the Burton films about him being a detective. 
So it, it, I really dug the, the neo-noir vibe to this one. Like I said, the David Fincher vibe. It feels very much like Seven or Zodiac. Down to, you know, the, the riddles are just like Zodiac letters. But dug it. I know that we talked about before. Love Colin Farrell in the movie. Unrecognizable. He's having so much fucking fun in the film. As Penguin. As Penguin. He's great. Uh, I really like the dynamic between Jeffrey Wright and, and Pattinson. I thought that they were pretty good together. They provide some of the laughs. I told you the guy I know was talking. Oh, it's not. There's no humor in it. So it's no good. It's like there there is some humor, but it's not it's not supposed to be a funny movie. It's supposed to be a pretty dark film. I do think it's kind of long, but also it kind of moves. It does move. It doesn't drag in any parts. Yeah, like I feel like you you know you you get to to the point where they capture um, the Riddler pretty fast, mm-hmm. and then you're you know you're you, you, you I feel like. You kind of come to a close and you don't feel that how long the actual movie is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's still like another hour after <laughs> they catch after they catch Dano. Yeah, because then now you know they have to figure out that he's rigged like the you know mm-hmm. all, uh, various parts in the city, and that's a whole un, un, no a whole other thing that happens. But very good, um, Paul uh, Dano. Very very good. Yeah, I thought he was really good in the movie. Uh, he's in another movie we're going to talk about shortly. Mm-hmm. Um, that I think he's just as good in. He's he's very good. Uh, that end, that climax at the convention center is really fucking awesome. Like it's it's living in the world that we are in now, especially in the post January sixth insurrection type world. I got serious vibes of that when I was watching, you know, those guys who had been radicalized online Mm -hmm. by the Riddler and uh, by his stuff. Almost, where it almost kind of felt a little too real, but it still makes for a really uh, good climax of the film. You know, when all those guys show up at the convention center in their gear, with their weapons, and are basically just there to be snipers Mm -hmm. and it it feels very real like i said considering everything that happened almost two years ago on january 6 2021 uh it very much has echoes of that and i know that this movie was in production long before that and had been written long before that but it you wonder like what the what the timeline is like did they know that that was not necessarily did they know, but just uh, it's kind of prescient. Yeah. Almost like predicting something that could happen, and it, in a way, it did. Are you excited uh, for them to expand on this? Yeah, I'm excited to see a sequel. I It sounded like it was pretty much going to be a standalone film, but of course, the movie business being the movie business, it was a highly successful film. You know, it's a big franchise with, you know, one of their their uh, big money makers. So I, I can see why. I'm glad that Reeves is going to be coming back. Make a shorter film this time. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'll be excited to see it. Also, again, shout out. The Giacchino score is awesome. Oh, yeah. You and Susie hooked that up for me when you guys went to Comic-Con. Thank you so much. It's great. You got me the special edition. Yeah, that's it's really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The music is awesome. It's it's one that I kind of pop in from time to time and and check out and listen listen to. It's it's really good. Also, I think we're all in an agreement with this, but um, for the most part. But uh, my buddy Ryan, who is also one of our co-hosts, wanted me to give a shout out uh, specifically to the Batman, saying that it's. 10 out of 10 uh, for the cinema, cinematography and the score. Yeah. Again. Good. Yeah. So, so shout out to Ryan. Yeah. The main theme that plays over kind of like the beginning when you're being introduced to the city and 
to like kind of the crime aspect of the city mm-hmm. is incredible. There's also uh, I don't know if you heard about it, but there's a graphic novel that was just released or is going to be released based on the film. Yeah, and cool. it's like a uh, deeper dive into the uh, character of the Riddler, but it's written by Paul Dano. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, awesome. So they allowed him to expand more in the. So it's pretty cool. It's a good concept, you know. Cool. Yeah. If you've been living under a rock and you haven't seen the Batman somehow, yeah. check it out. It's very good. Um, and Matt Reeves is a great filmmaker. A lot of people don't agree. I don't think I've seen a movie from him that I have not liked yet. Let's talk Nope. Nope. A movie that I think was kind of polarizing. Yes. A movie that, of course, you and I both loved. Mm-hmm. Was a lot of fun. Uh... Kiki Palmer is so fucking funny in the movie. Mm-hmm. If you've never seen her like on a talk show or be in an interview, go watch them. She's she's so magnetic. She has such a blast. She hosted Saturday Night Live maybe at the beginning of the month of December or maybe just before Thanksgiving. I can't remember. Somewhere around there. She's really fucking funny. They did like a, a Keenan and Kel sketch Mm -hmm. that was hilarious but love kiki palmer daniel kaluuya of course is awesome very very subdued in the movie but when the two of them are together on screen they have real chemistry yeah and it's you and you watched it in IMAX or no? Did you not make it to the IMAX? No, I, I, I saw it in IMAX. Okay. Yeah. Because... I can't say what I want to say, but you, yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Because I remember you, the first time you see, you you watched it, you hadn't seen it in IMAX. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. But I saw it again and okay. yeah, I caught it in IMAX. Yeah. It was... It's an it's an, a UFO movie without being a UFO. Because spoilers... You find out that it's not a UFO. It's actually an alien being Mm -hmm. uh, in the the third act. There's some terrifying scenes in it. Let's talk about Ricky. Uh, What was it? Ricky's home? Mm Mm-hmm. Which is... uh, Which is what starts the movie out. Almost like a non sequitur. That's polarizing. <laughs> yep, I think a lot <laughs> of sure. pe- a lot of people were confused as to what it what it means in the context of the story that we're watching. But at the same time, I think that that's intentional. That's how it, you're you know well, supposed to feel. Yes, but like it does tie into the movie. Mm-hmm. It ties into the movie with how we perceive things because obviously. Uh, um, Stephen Young's character, Jupe, is the little boy on that on that sitcom where the uh, the chimpanzee goes crazy and and kills and or maims everyone, everyone but him, but mm-hmm. his character. Uh, he kind of hasn't really processed it. I mean, he has like artifacts from that set, mm-hmm. which is like really weird and creepy. He has that hidden room that's designed like that living room. And he talks about people, you know, staying in there. Sleepovers and whatnot. Sleepovers, yeah. And he has that, like, he talks about, oh, this this Saturday Night Live sketch that they did. It's incredible. And he's talking about how, like, funny it is and how good it is. But it's like, that was a real, like, tragedy that happened to you. And he's, like, not really dealing with his grief the way that he should have but i also i think what we're meant to take away this is just my opinion but i i feel like he thinks that he was special because he was spared Mm -hmm. but it was really that he didn't actually look the chimp chimpanzee in in his eyes which comes back to later on Mm -hmm. in the film which the alien being doesn't attack you unless you unless you yeah unless it feels threatened unless you stare at it Mm -hmm. which ties into the horses and at the very beginning when you see uh, Kaluuya, o- OJ, with uh, with the horse. And he's, you know, telling the people that are on the commercial set, you know, what not to do and everything, you know. 
He's telling them, don't look it in the eyes, everything. And also with the Ricky's home thing, like, it's a wild animal. No matter how much you want to think that it's domesticated and tamed, it's still a wild animal. Mm -hmm. And will act accordingly. And that's, you know, the thing with, you know, the horses. He thinks that he can tame the, the alien. You know, he thinks he's special, can tame the alien. <laughs> Finds out, unfortunately, that he cannot. He's wrong, yeah. He's wrong. Which is, an, like, one of the most disturbing scenes in the film when, you know, he's trying to show the crowd and everything that he has this special power. And, you know, it's almost like a religious experience. And then everyone gets sucked up and eaten, basically. And you can hear him screaming and everything. And They take you inside. They take you inside. You're, you're watching them being digested, basically. <laughs> And then the, you know, the, the rain of like blood and, um, uh, what did, what was the term for it? The matter that, the they couldn't digest, that the alien couldn't digest is being like spit out, you know, like metal and change and watches, keys, stuff the flags, like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The indigestible material. Yeah. But that's a disturbing scene. My only my only major beef with it was I wanted Steven Young to be in more of it. I was bummed that he wasn't. Cause he's he's on the you know the the marketing and everything. He's one of the main characters, but I still felt like he wasn't in it enough. And he's a good actor and he's someone I love seeing on screen. I'm so happy that he got away from The Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. Because he was he he was by far one of the best actors on that show, and even though everyone was never uh, down with the way that he gets killed on the show, I'm glad that he got away from it and had an opportunity to to jump into more things and uh, be in bigger and better movies and lead movies. Yeah, you know he's now an Academy Award nominated actor uh, for Minari, which is a great movie if you haven't seen it. I was just bummed that he wasn't in it as much as I hoped he would have been. But he is very good in in Nope. I love Michael Wincott. Oh, yeah, that's right. He is in that. Michael Wincott, who seems to have, like, that Michael Madsen thing where he's, like, the older he gets, the more grizzled he sounds. Mm -hmm. He's always had that, like, great voice, but he, like, sounds even more grizzled. (laughs) And as a filmmaker, as as a documentarian... I was really excited, like when he had the the IMAX like crank camera, which I thought was really cool, because you know the I guess the alien's power, its energy, um, acts almost like a like a EMP, so that's why they couldn't use uh, electricity and everything, and that's why he has like the hand cranked IMAX camera, so he can continue. Yeah. Right. They're trying to get the. They're trying to get pictures of the, the, the thing to, yeah. to sell. You know, to uh, TMZ or uh, Kiki calls it the Oprah shot. <laughs> but I, I loved it. It was so much fun. Uh, he's always kind of done these like bigger Twilight Zone episodes uh, for his films, and this one was like one of the Alien Twilight Zone episodes. Uh, check it out. It just dropped on Blu-ray, and I think it's available now on Peacock. If you have Peacock, mm-hmm. you can stream it there exclusively. Yeah, because it's universal. Mm-hmm. Um, the IMAX shots are are great. In y- it. Yeah. Um, I, I know that's probably not translated as well to the smaller screen, but I liked it. And there wasn't a lot of cutting too. Uh, it felt like he did a lot of stuff in camera. Yeah, there's there's a couple of good uh, fake outs, mm-hmm. and at the beginning, or toward you know towards the beginning with the aliens, where he thinks like the aliens are in the barn. That's really good, a really funny scene. Yeah, that's it, it. Turns from it's pretty like disturbing at first, and then you realize that it's not real. Yeah, and you're like, oh okay. <laughs> But you feel the terror. It was almost like that that power and signs, you know? Especially because when you first see them, they're just kind of in the shadows. You're not really sure if that's what you're looking at. Mm-hmm. And even OJ's not really sure that that's what he's looking at. 
Yeah, I liked it a lot. It, it, it wasn't as big of a hit as his first two movies. I think it only made about half as much, which is disappointing. I think it was uh, just sci-fi. Is It's a niche type of thing, mm-hmm. you know? He swung for the fences and did something that's very different from his other two th- films. And I think I just... From what I gather from what people have told me and what I read is that just people didn't get it. Mm-hmm. They didn't understand what he was trying to do, which is kind of bizarre to me because it's not not that hard to understand. Yeah, there's nothing totally obscure about the movie. <laughs> it's no, it's not Get Out, you yeah. know, so maybe it was just the fact that it was, you know, not what people wanted or were what they were expecting mm-hmm. from him as a filmmaker. You can't make the same movie over and over again, guys. What's that? I know you said you just watched X, so I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts about about uh, um, Ty West's. X was fun too. Info. It was it was very much like a kind of '70s throwback slasher yeah. slasher film. Uh, I asked you before because I didn't realize this was going to turn into a trilogy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because I hadn't seen X, and then Pearl came out. I was like, I'm not going to go watch Pearl because I haven't seen X yet. But you said, "Mm, it probably won't really matter because Pearl is a prequel Mm -hmm. to X. She's the old lady in X, which you find out later on. Or I guess you don't really know because Pearl came out second. But Pearl is the story of the old woman. But because there's not a lot of... um, There's a lot of... They're shrouded in a lot of mystery. Mm-hmm. They're that couple that's at the center of X, which is why there was a lot of room to build upon that character. And I had no fucking idea. I don't even know if you know this, right? You know, as we're speaking right now, but that is Mia Goth yeah. in prosthetic makeup. Yeah, I was fairly certain it was, given that I knew about Pearl at mm-hmm. this point in time. Mm-hmm. But then, yeah, at the end credits, it says, uh, "What I forget what her name was." Maxine, it's Maxine, yeah, because the Maxine movie's coming out. Mm-hmm. Literally watched this movie yesterday. <laughs> Had a lot of information come at me yesterday. Um, yeah, uh, it says Maxine slash Pearl is Mia Goth, who's fantastic in the movie. And from what you have said, she's really great in Pearl too. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, she wrote or helped to write the screenplay for Pearl. Yep. Do you know if she's going to be in on the Maxine screenplay too? That I'm not sure. There is a. Uh... I don't know if this is this isn't uh, um, because you already know about Maxine. This isn't a spoiler, but if you wait to the end, the credits wrap up at the end of Pearl. There's a little kind of um, um, teaser mm-hmm. for Maxine, and it's basically the Hollywood sign, but it says Maxine, mm-hmm. um, and it's like some like a VCR kind of tracking promo thing um but that's it that's all that we've gotten i don't know i'm gonna assume that she's probably gonna be in on on it creatively if she was for pearl and and i think pearl did really well um critically Mm -hmm. Um, i wonder yeah i have to look that up did it do well did it do better than x did critically i don't know i've uh i've had a couple friends who said that they think that they prefer Pearl mm-hmm. because it's mainly Mia Goth is carrying the entire thing. Mm-hmm. She's not part of any ensemble. Yeah, but but X is X is uh, great too. I don't know if if I even have an opinion on that now. I think they're both kind of like maybe on a par. Mm-hmm. They both do what they do. Um, Pearl's wild, wildly different mm-hmm. than X, you know? So I don't know if it's even a good, if it's a fair comparison. But I'm excited to wrap up this trilogy. Ty West uh, is a good filmmaker. And Mia Goth is awesome. I can't wait for Infinity Pool. It looks fucking yeah, wild. it does. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Possessor, you know, Brendan Cronenberg. It should be good. Yeah, I'm excited for it. We talked about Jenna Ortega earlier, who's in X. Yes. Who's very good. She's she's the sound the sound person, but also seems a little uptight at first. Mm-hmm. And then after after talking to to the, the cast, which is also Kid Cudi, who was so good in the movie. Um, and then Brittany Snow. 
after talking to them, kind of realizing that, you know, what, what they're about, she decides that she wants to be part of the film, too, like actually in the movie, mm -hmm. which doesn't sit well with her boyfriend, the director. Mm -hmm. But uh, she's really good in the movie, kind of playing very timid at first and then being a little bit more assertive. And She arguably has the biggest arc. Yeah. Of all the characters, she has the, mo the most to do. And probably the most brutal death. <laughs> yeah, I was not expecting what happens to her. But even just the fingers thing, when she's reaching through to yeah. unlock that door and the the, the old man like what, fucking hacks at her fingers, and but you see it in real time. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, good makeup work in it. It was fun, dude. I, I was kind of like, mm, not really like super excited for it and then you would you would watch it mm -hmm. you're like ah, oh, it's pretty good i think you'll like it so i just got around to watching it uh i mean i kept meaning to see it i wish i had watched pearl now but uh finally got around to watching it made a point to watch it before the show because i knew we'd probably be talking about it so i wanted to get in on it saw it enjoyed it looking forward to seeing pearl yeah, I think... Um, and Maxine. Yeah. I think I think you'll enjoy Pearl, and I can't wait to, to talk to you about it. Cool. You... Cool, I'll let you know when I do. Have you seen uh, the Multiverse of Madness yet? No. No, I will eventually when I watch, or when I uh, do blank check Sam Raimi miniseries. So I will watch it then, but haven't seen it yet. Uh, it's very good. Um, you know, obviously you just said Sam Raimi was in the director's seat for this and it shows, uh, very strong horror influences. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just had a lot of fun with it. You know, there's always like a couple of Marvel movies that come out each year, maybe that feel different. Mm hmm. And this year it would be this one, the multiverse of madness and then, uh, Wakanda forever. Because you have Ryan Coogler, who is a mm -hmm. great filmmaker, you know. Um, but, yeah, going back to the Multiverse of Madness, it was, it's great, but it also came out on the heels of uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Which and, is a movie that you and I will talk about. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, probably, I would still pick Everything Everywhere. As a be as the better film. Oh, as, yeah. Well, I mean, I haven't seen Multiverse Madness, <laughs> but like a hundred percent. I think even Jamie Lee Curtis went on record and was like accused them of <laughs> low key copying because they're both in the kind of in the metaverse uh, and the they're very similar in a lot of different ways. But but yeah, a twenty four man. So you want to talk about it? Yeah, that's that's a good segue. I think right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I didn't see it in the theaters, and I really wish I had. For some reason, it was just it came out at a time where I was either really busy or just no, I couldn't scrape up the time. It was the still things are kind of bad. Or things were dicey with the pandemic. Yeah, because I didn't even go. Okay, okay, so it's not just me. No, I did catch it because it's it's on Showtime now. Like Scream and XR, They're, they got a really good lineup right now. Uh, of movies that are that are uh, streaming or available if you have Showtime. Yeah. But yeah, watched it last night. Loved it. It might be my favorite movie of the year because it's just it's so fucking fun. Uh, Michelle Yeoh, who has always been incredible, is fantastic in this movie. Um. I always thought that she should have gotten more recognition for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, because mm -hmm. she's fantastic in that. Uh, I hope that she gets recognition for this movie, because she's great in it. As is the uh, guy who plays her husband, uh, Ki Hu, Hu Kwan, mm -hmm. who is short round from Temple of Doom. Yes. Uh, for those who don't know, who's great in everything, everywhere, all at once. He's so good. I hope he gets recognition. 
Now he's also in the Goonies, right? Yeah, he's he's uh, Data in the Goonies as well. And just kind of was doing his own thing, and then they circled back to him, and he's in this movie, and he's so fucking good in it. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I Every scene between them, I mean, he's he's good in it, yeah, but the, the scenes that he has with Michelle Yeoh in whatever universe they're in, whether it's the laundromat where then, you know, their husband and wife and he's not really vibing with her anymore and is kind of looking for the divorce or the universe where they didn't uh, run off to America together and, Mm -hmm. you know, he meets her again at the movie premiere and they have that, like, discussion about, you know, even, even though things didn't work out this way, uh, I would still love to be with you, even if we're just running a laundromat. You know, he's 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 phenomenal in those 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 scenes, and their scenes together are so good. And uh, their daughter Stephanie Shu, who's kind of like the main villain <laughs> yeah. in the movie, is is having like so much fun. She's great. She's a great villain in because all of those iterations of of her character. Um, and Jamie Lee Curtis is is pretty good as kind of a secondary villain, but then also has in one of the universes has a great arc with Michelle Yeoh, like as a couple that are in love, kind of falling out of love at the beginning of that arc and then reconnecting at the end of that arc in the hot dog finger universe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> it was so much fun. I had a blast. This was the movie I was talking about where the aspect ratio changes mm-hmm. constantly because mm-hmm. it's flat and then it's cinema scope and then it's the one three three academy frame. Uh, the music in it is great. There's tons of references. The- I, I really like the way that the the universe is kind of colliding or when when they're able to like jump into the body. I kind of liked. That especially with with uh, her husband with Wayman, like when you can see him on the the closed circuit, oh yeah, like running around the laundromat. There's obviously like something's up with them, or even that scene in the elevator when they go to the IRS office where you just kind of see him change, mm-hmm. and then he's you know trying to to give her the the instructions on like what to do. It's so funny his fight scene at oh. the IRS building. It's <laughs> so with, fucking good. With the um with the fanny pack. Fanny pack, yeah. <laughs> when he gets the sea the like the sea rocks from the fish tank. He put, <laughs> makes it heavier. Dude, it's choreography so good. Yeah. I loved everything about it. It's such a blast. And I I just kick myself for not being able to see that in the theater and waiting this long to to watch it. And I had heard that this was probably uh, a lot of people's favorite of the year and didn't want to get like overhyped. But watching it last night, I was like, no, it it's definitely either my number one or number two. I, I enjoyed it so much. And again, speaking of, you know, another movie that kind of hits me pretty hard emotionally, like the climax uh, between her and her daughter mm-hmm. is is so good and really made me emotional as well. You know, they're, her daughter is the villain and even uh, uh, Michelle Yeoh's father, the great James Hong, is telling telling her you need to kill her so that she can't she can't she can't jump into this universe any any longer. And she refuses because even though that she knows that her daughter is bad and is the villain, it's still her daughter. And she doesn't want her to do what she's doing and tries to find a way to reconnect with her. And that that scene that comes towards the, the middle section of the, the uh, everywhere, or the everything section, when Wayman is telling uh, Evelyn, you know, hey, be nice, you know, try kindness. Instead of trying to fight everyone, and it works when you see her take on all all the uh, all of the henchmen, and instead of actually beating them up, she she manipulates them to kind of make them happier. Instead of fighting with them, she does what they need in order for them to be happy. 
Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's hooking them up with the significant other or spraying the guy with the perfume because it reminds the perfume reminds him of his late wife. And even like uh, when she karate chops the guy in the neck, it kind of fixes like the ailment mm-hmm. that he had with his neck. But it's, it was so it was so fun. And even even that little arc that she has uh, with Jamie Lee Curtis in the the hot dog finger universe is like so powerful and sad. And then like the the feet because they have the hot dog fingers, they have to use their feet. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen that they they sell the hot dog uh, like hands where mm-hmm. you can put them on? I, th- I think when that movie came out, she did a. a interview with Deez and Mero on their show mm-hmm. and they, they busted out like the, the hot dog finger hands <laughs> but uh, I loved it and everyone is great in it and I really hope that when it comes awards time it doesn't get forgotten about because it's like a weirder a weirder film yeah because everyone's so good in it hopefully they get recognized hopefully the film gets recognized it was like I said probably the most fun I've had uh, this year in a movie. And I really wish I could have seen it on the big screen, especially because they released it in IMAX at one point. Well, uh, before I saw this movie, I'll tell you what my number one movie of the year was uh, before Everything Everywhere All at Once, at least before I had seen that. A movie that you and I both loved and both uh, shouted out on the podcast way back when, and that's The Northman. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Which was so awesome. Uh, well, we were both so stoked for it because we're both big fans of Robert Eggers, and it did not disappoint whatsoever. It was it's it is so good. It's pretty fucking hardcore, and was super excited. And you know who's really fucking good in it, it was Nicole Kidman. That whole scene where he like goes back and like you know talks to her and says hey i'm your son and everything and then it's kind of revealed that she was the one that set in motion the uh the regicide the the king's murder Mm -hmm. you know and she wanted him dead as well like that seems incredible like oh i wish i hope that she gets a bit of recognition as well because she's really fucking good in that movie not to mention uh scars guard is is incredible in the movie, as is Anya Taylor Joy. Bjork. Bjork. <laughs> That's right. And then, of course, Ethan Hawke, Willem Dafoe. Stacked cast. Wish some of them could have stuck around a little bit longer, but. True. But all very good. Um, yeah, this is everything you would want it to be. From waiting, you know, for this to be released, going to see it. The fight choreography is really good. Robert Eggers is one of those directors who has only made three films, like Jordan Peele. Uh, I mean, Ari Aster's only made two. He's supposed to have a third coming out. I thought it would make it by the end of the year, but I guess it's not. With uh, Joaquin, right? Yeah, Disappointment Boulevard, who hasn't made a bad movie yet. And I'm super excited to see whatever is coming up next. Like, I'll be there. You and I have talked many times about the other two films. I think we've recommended them plenty of times. You've done an episode on The Witch. Way yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. Love The Lighthouse. I know that I just recommended that not terribly long ago. Maybe for October. Was my one of my recommendation was one of my recommendations because I had just rewatched it. I know that we talked about it on our best of 2019 episode. So now he's got another movie that's on our best of episode. Definitely deserving. Yeah. Of that spot. Yeah. Cinematography incredible. That climax that happens at the gates of hell. When he fights his uh, his stepfather, it, it's god damn. I think it's on Amazon Prime right now. Yeah, I was going to give it a shout yeah. out. I believe you can watch it on Prime. I should, I should go back and watch it once uh, once things kind of settle down after the New Year's. Because yeah, 
when I saw this, I was like, man, that's probably my favorite fucking movie of the year so far. I mean, it was only like three or four months in. But still stoked on it. Probably just under it at number two for me. Behind everything, everywhere, all at once. Focus, focus features? Focus, okay. I was going to say, New Regency sounds like Fox, because they usually do a lot of, of production for Fox, but it's... it's uh, focus? If... Uh, if you need to be convinced to watch The Northman, 300 is for pussies. Watch The Northman. <laughs> I could say that with <laughs> confidence that, yes, The Northman is better than Zach's. Way better and way more hardcore. Yeah. Than 300. <laughs> There's no fake shit. Um, have you got to see The Black Phone yet? I have not watched The Black Phone. I think it just came on to like Hulu or something. It's a good one. I think I saw it streaming somewhere. It was Scott Derrickson. Who did the original Doctor Strange. Yes, that is true. Yeah. Black Phone's good. Ethan Hawke's always good. It was one I really wanted to see. Uh, uh, I was... I really like Sinister a lot. Mm -hmm. Except for that stupid laugh shot. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't... The movie does not need it. Yeah. Which smacks very much of like a studio note. Uh, but yeah, I was really excited uh, with Sinister and was really looking forward to the Black Phone. And I think it, it got shuffled around on the schedule a bit. And that, that might have been where I lost it. Yeah, because I think it was originally going to come out in 2021. I think it was like a February movie this year. Mm -hmm. Like when it was coming out like around Valentine's Day and they got pushed. To the summer. It was the summer, right? Yeah. Open, like in June or something? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Um, uh, especially, like, if you like, I guess, horror films that involve children. Mm -hmm. um, this does a... The film does a very good job of kind of uh, writing that fine line uh, between, you know, or I guess being tasteful still. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. Great, uh, great score, great performances. Um, Do you know who did the score? Do you, Mark Corvin? I'm not sure I'm familiar with his work. The mastermind behind The Witch, The Lighthouse. Oh, whoa, and okay. Into the Tall Grass. So the two leads, it's um, Madeline McGraw and then Mason Thames. Mm -hmm. Madeline McGraw is so fucking good. Uh, if you're gonna watch the movie. Besides Ethan Hawke being the villain, watch it for her. Mm -hmm. Because she's fucking incredible child actor. Um, so funny. And um, she just does a, a great job as a whole. If that makes... If I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, but check it out. The Black Phone. You said it's streaming now on... I, either Hulu or Amazon. Like I just saw it the other night when... Uh... When I was in one of those. I could be wrong, but I th it's saying it's streaming on Prime. Okay. So maybe yeah. it's Prime. Yeah, that would make sense because I was watching something on Amazon. It's got 83 on Rotten for anybody who takes those scores seriously. Uh, I did want to give a shout out to a film that has only 35% on Rotten right now. But um, it was like an, uh, a film that was released earlier in the year... Uh, by Adrian Lin, uh, Deep Water, with okay. uh, Anna Darmus and Ben Affleck. I guess a lot of people don't didn't enjoy it, um, but I thought it was good. It was kind of like a fun throwback to those like '90s erotic thrillers mm -hmm. that we used to get a lot more. Um, and it was just fun seeing Anna Darmus be like so bad mm -hmm. and shady like you don't see it besides knock knock which was one of her first fucking roles yeah. ever um she hasn't really kind of dove in that direction you know so this this movie is good okay it's it's on my list uh, unfortunately my list is super long with mm -hmm. a lot of streaming movies that i just don't really think about because i never know when they actually came or when they're coming out yeah I, I pay much more attention to what's in the movie theater because obviously I love going to see movies in the theater. Mm -hmm. So I don't pay as much attention to when stuff gets released on streaming. So my list of stuff to catch up on is 
pretty loaded with a lot of streaming movies. Because as that's like a that is like a direct to Hulu, right? Yeah, because a lot of stuff that was set up at 20th Century Fox before Fox got sold off to Disney. Only some of the bigger release movies uh, are getting uh, theater theatrical releases. Everything else is going straight to Hulu. Okay. Unfortunately, and I think that that was one of those Fox movies that they didn't really care enough to to put out in the theater, so they just released it to Hulu. Cool. Like another movie that you and I are going to talk about here in a moment. But I'll check out Deep Water. Did you see Blonde? Then did you watch Blonde? Or no? I did watch Blonde. Yes. Should I waste my time with that? Because I know that's another long movie. Um, from a director that I like, I would I would watch it. Okay, I didn't because uh, I heard a lot of mixed things on that one too. Watch it for Anna Darmus. Okay, because her performance is great. I feel like the the movie the movie is good, but it kind of um I'm trying to articulate my thoughts better. Uh, it just seems like. Overall, it's just kind of becomes guilty of doing like the trauma porn thing mm-hmm. a little bit too much where it's kind of, there is no, and I understand that Marilyn Monroe's life in real life was, she, she went through a lot of things, but she also did a lot of cool things and mm-hmm. accomplished a lot. And Was a hell of an actress. And the movie kind of over just revels in the the bat stuff okay you know um so it is worth a watch i would check it out anna kills it but i was a little disappointing in the the things that they chose to to touch on okay if that makes sense yeah yeah okay yeah well let's talk about that movie that was from fox that went straight to hulu instead of being released in the theaters which it should have been because i would have loved to have seen this movie in the theater and that's prey Prey is amazing. It's so fucking good. Why that didn't get a theatrical release in a summer that wasn't that only had like a few really bright spots. Like I wish that that would have been released in the theater. Yeah, and how well it was crafted would been it would have. There's no way this would not have made money. Yeah, it was that they they messed up. They messed uh, up with this. Loved it. Thought it was great. I'm not wild about um, any of the sequels. Mm-hmm. Predator is always... Or any of the pseudo-sequels like Alien vs. Predator. Oh, of course. Predator mm-hmm. has always been an amazing film and then kind of everything else is... Not meddling, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Predator's probably being the one that's above the rest. Because um, it's an interesting yeah. premise, has a very stacked cast. Mm-hmm. You and I have talked on air a few times about our disappointment with the Predator. Oh, yeah, and Shane Black. And we won't talk about the Alien vs. Predator because those movies are straight trash. <laughs> but Prey was so fucking good. Amber Mid Thunder is fantastic. Uh, for those who haven't seen Legion. Go and watch Legion. She's great in that. She's kind of like the muscle. Uh, she has a lot of really... Whoop, sorry about that. You're good. She has a lot of really good fight scenes in uh, in that show. Uh, probably my favorite character on that show. So I'm always happy to see her. I know that we talked about it as a recommendation a few months back, but she also pops up on the latest season of Reservation Dogs mm-hmm. and is very funny in an episode. So I was happy that she is the main star of this film, her and the dog, because the dog is <laughs> pretty awesome <laughs> in the film too. But I was super, I was super stoked that uh, that she was headlining the movie, and uh, really got a good chance because I think she's a really good actress, and really uh, is a lot of fun uh, when I see her in a role. And this was great, and it's got some great action in it. And that whole scene where the, uh, like the French uh, trappers, are being slaughtered is insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really they take it to the next level. There's there's a couple of good callbacks to 
uh, earlier Predator films. Mm -hmm. Probably the biggest being the flintlock pistol that she gets from one of the trappers. But also, you know, with the the body heat thing, kind of figuring out the the body heat. But just yeah, call back to Schwarzenegger mm -hmm. figuring that out, right? Yeah. Do one ugly motherfucker. <laughs> Predator's a pretty perfect film. And this this one, especially because it focused on uh, Comanche. Yes. And there's, you know, the who did a really cool thing where they released, you know, a Comanche cut. Or not necessarily a Comanche cut, a, a cut of the film that was in... Dub. Comanche dub, yeah. yeah. Which is really awesome. And it's just, it was... It was a refreshing take from a director that I was always wondering what his next movie was going to be, because Ten Cloverfield Lane is great, but that was six, seven years ago now. Yeah, when was that? Twenty thirteen, fifteen, twenty sixteen, somewhere around there. Uh, twenty sixteen. Wow, so a while. So yeah, it was Dan Trachtenberg. I was wondering when he was going to make another movie and. He made this one and was pleasantly surprised how Solid. fucking awesome it was. Yeah. Arguably, maybe the best fucking Predator sequel we've gotten. Oh, like hands down. Hands down. Like, 2 has its moments, and even uh, Predators is pretty decent. It's got a good cast. Yeah. But also, it's no nowhere near as compelling no. as, as Prey. No. And of course, like you touched on the representation, everything that they, you know, that they did, the fucking the gorgeous cinematography mm -hmm. for a Hulu original, it's incredible. Um, probably, maybe, dare I say, the best like uh, streaming release all year would be maybe Prey. I won't disagree with you there. Again, why that wasn't released in the movie theater, I don't know. Was it the the hard R rating because of all the gore and the violence? Who knows? Like again, why Fox? Why the the Fox movies have to get straight to Hulu releases instead of getting a theatrical release? I don't know. If Violent Night can make its money back <laughs> the weekend that it's released, then Prey could have made money. Yeah. Yeah. So let that be a lesson to everyone. When you have a movie as fucking awesome as that, don't stick it straight to streaming. Put it out in the theaters first. You'll make a lot more money, and you'd be surprised what the what the audience is there for. I think it was the most... It might still be, like, the most streamed film ever in Hulu history. Wow. Well, <laughs> okay, then. then that, should, that should tell Hulu what, whatever they need to know. I know that you'll reach more people with streaming than you would in the theater, but put it out in the theater first. Or do like, you know, Netflix does, where they kind of have the... The run. The run yeah. in the theater. And then, you know, release it to, to streaming. That might segue... Uh, we can segue into something else. I haven't watched it yet, unfortunately. Yeah, I like how you knew exactly <laughs> where I was going with that. I really wanted to see it. I'm really excited. Just haven't been able to, to find the time. So I watched it earlier today. Oh, okay. Because I figured I was all pretty sure he's going to be ready. Nope. To talk about it. Nope. Unfortunately, I did not get a chance to see it. All right. Well, we well, wanted to see it in the theater, but I think they were only they only had it in the theater for a week, maybe two. It was a week. Yeah. Like, it was one. It was it was gone very quickly. Ryan got to see it and he was talking it up. He said he recommended it that week that he saw it on the on the mm -hmm. show and said. That, of course, it's not better than the first one, but it's really fucking good and very funny. And I'm going to stop you right here. Why don't you tell the audience what it is we're talking about? You and I know what we're talking about. Glass Onion. There we go. Okay. Is what we're talking about. <laughs> like, what fucking movie are those guys talking about? Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> Glass Onion and uh, what's a Knives Out mystery. Yeah, which is what I read Ryan Johnson didn't want to have that. The title? The the subtitle. He didn't want it? No. He just wanted to call it Glass Onion. So why did they put it there? 
because studio? yeah, Netflix wants them to know. Oh, this is a Knives Out movie. This is a Knives Out sequel. But well, and, and in case they thought no one's gonna watch a movie called Glass Onion because they thought it was a dumb title or something. They, they made him put that there, and I guess he didn't want to put it there. But they also shelled out something like four hundred million for him to make two or three movies, so they're the boss. Actually, yeah, that's true. He did. They did pay him a shit ton of money. Yeah. Um. It's good. I'm I'm excited for it. Like you said, the cast is stacked. Uh, Knives Out was a movie that you and I both talked about on the best of 2019 that we both loved think that daniel craig is having the time of his life in that movie and i'm hoping that the same is is said for glass onion um yeah i think you're gonna have a lot of fun with it um edward norton coming back we haven't seen him since what motherless brooklyn maybe wow wow that's been a long time then yeah at least i personally haven't heard of him doing anything in t- uh, he's he's in a um, uh, French dispatch but being oh. a Wes Anderson movie he doesn't have a huge role because everyone's got you know bit pieces five to seven minutes of screen time that's funny because I just caught like a chunk of Birdman the other day mm. I was thinking oh he's so good in that like I hope he gets a chance to kind of go back to doing something like that mm-hmm <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna you'll love Glass Onion. Okay, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Glass Onions, and I'm talked about like the 30 movies that are on that list. Glass Onions, like right at the top. And not that anybody needs to talk him up, but Daniel Craig is so fucking good. That's good. Again, he's That's good. Yeah, you, if you loved what he did in Knives Out, you're gonna have a blast with this one. He's funny. I just always think about that scene where he's in the car and knives out, listening to the iPod mm-hmm. or listening to his phone. He's kind of like, a, "Oh dear." <laughs> I always think about that. And he's like, you know, he's having so much fun in this movie. <laughs> Bones and all. Yes, I was. I was gonna say, what, let's let's look for one that I know you and I will will both uh, have on the list. Bones and all, which. Was one of the movies where when I saw the trailer, I was like really excited for it. Like, yeah. Kind of like surprisingly, like how excited I was to see it. And went to go see it first show, I think on opening day, because uh, it was before Thanksgiving, like the, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And that's a day I normally have off. So I said, fuck it, I'm going to go to the movies early uh, because I really wanted to see that. And. I love it when I'm like one or one of like two or three people in the theater. Absolutely love it. There was one other person in the theater who fucking bailed. They left. Like immediately, like in that first like really gory scene. The the scene where they the they end up having to leave town because of it? What? No. No. Stuck around through that. Mm-hmm. But that was oh man, the finger bite is pretty it's pretty Graphic. I think she, I think she strips like the flesh off the bone. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was not expecting that. That was kind of like where my heart like, drops immediately. So I'm like, holy shit! The that's, sound that's design, way, yeah. yeah, that's a way to start. <laughs> um, no, uh, the first kill, not the first kill, but the first time you actually see uh, them eating mm. her, her and Rylance, mm-hmm. and Rylance is basically like a dog on the floor. Like tearing pieces of this body off. The person left after yeah. they were offended. They were like, "Peace out." <laughs> <laughs> which which brings us to the discussion you and I have had off air, where it's like, "What were you expecting? Did you not know what this movie was about?" Especially coming from the guy who did the Suspiria a couple years ago. Yeah. Like this isn't out of the realm of possibility, you know. Like this is, I don't know. It's just funny, but. I, I thought that was hilarious. And then, of course, that leaves me the only person in the theater, and I'm loving the film. <laughs> and it's really good. I, like, uh, I mean, you said people were going to watch it because of Chalamet, not really knowing what they were getting into mm-hmm. and not liking it, but who's very good in the movie. But, man, Taylor Russell is phenomenal Yeah, in the film. She is so fucking good. She carries it. For- in the movie. She carries it. It's her, it's her story, basically. Yep. Because even at certain points, like Chalamet 
she she leaves him. Yeah, and runs out, runs out on him or whatever. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, and it's 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 her story. It's her film. Um, and yeah, she's incredible in the movie. And as good as Chalamet is, that movie doesn't work unless that lead, that female lead, is good. And Taylor Russell just nails it. I hope that she gets recognition. Um, the scene where like she goes to see her mom. Mm-hmm. Another just like, holy shit. And then yeah, and then who it is the mm-hmm. the the cameo which I won't spoil because mm-hmm. it's still a newer movie that just hit digital actually I think you can get it on demand at home because I think it's a Fox movie I told you the Fox the theatrical window for Fox is very short right they now they drop it yeah. it's only about forty five days I I had heard unfortunately that this movie's not doing that well but that I'm, wouldn't surprise me because of. The kind of movie it is. It's yeah. also it's also a very weird movie because it's like a mashup of about three or four different types of films. Yeah, you know, it's a love story. It's a kind of, for all intents and purposes, a horror film. A road movie. A road movie, um, almost like a coming of age movie as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's that's what I thought its strength its strengths were mm-hmm. is that it's a mashup of a few different type of movies. I know the the trailer kind of plays up a bit more of the horror aspects of it. Because the scene, the scene with uh, Stuhlbarg and, and David Gordon Green, oh yeah, at the yeah. campfire when they roll up on them is like really creepy and tense. And they're like, "Oh, so you're not really one of us?" Yeah. He's all, "No, man." <laughs> it's like, what the? Fuck? <laughs> How did David Gordon Green end up like acting in the movie? <laughs> yeah, when I saw him, I was like, "Is that who I think?" Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> so funny. He's, he's that scene's really good, but like. The entire time, I'm really tense because I'm thinking, oh, man, something's going to happen. Like, the other shoe is going to drop in this scene, mm-hmm. and something's going to happen. And I think Taylor Russell's character, like, knows it, too, because they're like, we got to get out of here. And even as they're getting in the car to drive away, like, Stuhlbar gets up and almost, like, kind of chases them for a little bit. Like, they, they, they had ideas mm-hmm. in, their, in their head about something. But... I loved it, man. I it was it's one of my favorite movies of the year. We're talking about movies I really loved this year, and that's probably in that top five. If I had to choose the score, the the cinematography is incredible. I told you it had a Ross and Reznor score, mm-hmm. which is fantastic. There's another movie this year that they did the score to that is fantastic as well, and a lot different from some of the other scores that they've done, especially their Fincher scores. So, was really surprised where I was listening to the score, wondering like, hmm, like, who did that score? Because it's really good. And then the song, the movie ends with the uh, with the Reznor song. And I was like, oh, that's that's Trent's voice. Who did the score? And then when the credits come up, because there's no credits in the beginning, mm-hmm. when the credits come up, and I saw like the Reznor and Ross did the score, I was like, oh, okay, that's awesome. That makes sense. And that was an incredible score. But I want to shout him out. Like Rylance is really good in the movie. He pops up in a few different times in the film, mm-hmm. and he's really good. Where he kind of he he's almost like loving and paternal at first, and then kind of takes that turn, and is is very creepy after that. Yeah, his uh, that character kind of reminded me of like uh, Doctor Sleep. Mm-hmm. Some Doctor Sleep stuff um, it was Mike Flanagan, and then the whole like it, the film being like a road movie and like this unorthodox kind of love story as well, brought me back to um, Near Dark mm-hmm. as well. So it was kind of a mixture. It was cool to, um, especially to have just rewatched Near Dark and then go into this and be like, oh yeah, I can see like the comparisons. Mm-hmm. But Bones and all, very very good. For anyone who hasn't seen it yet, highly recommend it. Just know what you're getting into. There's going to be some gore, but some. You know what shocked me? Not nearly as much as I thought that there was going to be. No, there's it's like oh, it's a cannibal movie, but there's really only a couple of scenes, and even that scene of like Rylance like ripping a chunk out of that woman's torso is a split second. Yeah, and it doesn't linger on it. No, no, they're fast. 
It's fast. It's it's the one at the very be- that's the finger bite at the very beginning that like your stomach just sinks because you're not expecting it to happen. <laughs> Surprisingly, my my list is a bit horror heavy this year, but there wasn't like a good like big time sci fi movie. Nope. That caught my attention. Besides Nope, and maybe, you, I guess you could say Everything Everywhere All at Once mm-hmm. has some sci-fi elements to it. Yeah. But uh, here's one that's a horror movie, but kind of like a weird horror movie that's so much fucking fun, and that was Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Oh, yes. <laughs> Which is really fun. Uh, <laughs> it's it's very much like a, like a Gen Z type movie. Mm-hmm. And... Great performances. I told you a few years back, like, Amanda Stenberg was one to watch, and she's so fucking good in this movie, <laughs> as is uh, Maria Bakalova. I hope I say her name right. Uh, the, the blonde, mm-hmm. who's kind of our our, uh, our focus character in the film, or our, our audience uh, surrogate character in the film joining this this group that she doesn't really know. She's just Amanda Stenler, Amanda Stenberg's girlfriend in the in the film. But she's she's from the Borat movie, right? Yeah. She was really good in the movie. It's really funny. They're so fucking self absorbed. <laughs> There's all like all the the dialogue is, is hilarious. The Pete Davidson stuff. When he pops up in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and even Lee Pace, who's a guy I don't really care for that much, is pretty fucking good in the movie. <laughs> like, kind of playing like kind of a dirtbag. Yeah. <laughs> who's <laughs> definitely dating someone way younger than he probably should be. And who has a, a pretty good death. His scene in the gym is pretty fuck. Yeah. 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 That's his, his, what ends up with being his death scene. But that's good. They play that game. Where, you know, they don't know who the killer is because it's in the dark. And then, like, one by one, they start dying. It, it's it's a really good black comedy mm-hmm. horror film. Uh, kind of that, like, has, like, elements of the thing in it. Not necessarily the monster version, but, like, you don't know who the killer is. Everyone is very suspicious of everyone else, and rightly so. Yeah, it's another kind of like who done it style movie, modern, mm-hmm. modernized, of course. But uh, yeah, the the actual twist is like fucking. It's genius because you never, you'll never think of that without spoiling anything. We won't spoil it because it, it it's a huge fucking laugh when you find out like what the twist is. Um. And even even I laugh because they're they're talking off screen about this guy who left like the night before, mm-hmm. and then I won't spoil who it is when it shows up. If you might be familiar with him, you might not. I am because I know the comedy, uh, and he's been he's uh, been in a couple of things that I really that I really love, comedy wise. I'm afraid if I even say what those are, it might spoil. Who, uh, who it is? Who it is? Because <laughs> when when he's he's talked about, and then when you finally see him, I was like, "Holy shit, it's him!" <sighs> Fucking laughed. And again, I'm like one of two people in this theater, so I'm having a blast. Rachel Sennett is very good in it. Uh, she was Alice. Uh, she's very good in the movie called Shiva Baby that I was telling you about after after I watched Bodies, 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 uh, where she's at a. a a bat mitzvah, mm-hmm. and she's like trying to avoid her her ex in in the movie. Very funny movie. I would highly recommend that. But yeah, bodies, bodies, bodies <laughs> is a lot of fucking fun. That might be the second movie behind everything, everywhere, all at once that I had the most fun in this year. I have four more, three of which I don't think you've seen, so I can burn through those really quick. Okay, yeah, let's hear them. Actually, I don't think you've seen any of them. The four that I have left, I'm pretty sure Wesley hasn't seen, but I'll go through them really quick. Uh, the Menu, which I believe I brought up earlier when we were talking about Hong Chow, how she's really great in The Menu. 
as uh, Ray Fiennes is like number two. Yeah. Uh, really sinister. Great scene. Our uh, our podcast favorite Anya Taylor Joy is great in the movie. Ray Fiennes is great. It's like the he's the celebrity chef. These all these people are going to like this remote location to eat eat a, a meal that he's prepared. You know, a, I don't know five or six course meal that he's prepared. And really good, kind of a horror movie, like an elevated horror movie, but not so much horror as it is more of a, a class commentary. Okay. And Nicholas Holt is great in it, too. And you can kind of tell, this is not a spoiler, but you can kind of tell from the beginning, he's a pretty good douchebag. And he plays it very well <laughs> in the film. Uh, so I would highly recommend that. That's... While we're sitting here with the TV on behind you, there are literally a uh, commercial for the menu coming to HBO like next month or next week, even which I guess would technically be next month because we're at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, it's going to be on HBO very soon. It's probably still in theaters because it was doing pretty well. This was a movie that I saw late night uh, after work one night and was surprised that there were a handful of people in it still. There was probably 10 or 12 other people in it. And uh, I was very surprised because the movie had been out for a few weeks already. And I was watching, you know, like a 9, 30, 10 o'clock show of it. And hmm. there, was, there was quite a few people in it, but really loved it. Uh, another movie that I, I don't want to spoil anything, especially since you haven't seen it. But it's well worth it. And everyone in the movie is very good. Those four people that I shouted out especially. A good John Leguizamo part where he's kind of playing like a douchey character as well someone is a little too full of himself I know it was your boy's number one movie if I'm not mistaken but Top Gun Maverick was a lot of fun I was surprised that I liked it as much as I did I did see it. I, I'm not in the theater but I did watch it at home you did I watch have, it okay, seen, okay. so you have it. seen this movie Yeah. so let's talk a little bit about it uh, too bad you didn't see it in IMAX. It was really fucking awesome in IMAX. I will give you this. I think it's, and I rarely say this, but I think it's an improvement on Top Gun. Really? I, I think I enjoyed Maverick, at least how it's aged. Mm -hmm. I think Maverick will stand the test of time a little better. I feel like it just has a little more meat on its bones. Mm -hmm. Not a whole lot happens in Top Gun. Going back and rewatching it recently over the summer. Um, but Maverick, uh, for what it is, it's it's good. I agree with you. I know you said before I had watched it to check it out in IMAX because the um, the flight scenes are amazing. Well, and especially because a movie like Nope, Top Gun, it was shot specifically for IMAX. Yeah. So when you see it in IMAX, That's, it looks incredible. Uh -huh. It's not a movie that you know was converted or is just kind of blown up. Uh, no, like it, it fills the screen and it's incredible. And uh, I really got to hand it to, to Tom Cruise because they could have released this to streaming during the pandemic because this movie was supposed to come out, I think, May of 2020. And he held it. Didn't want to release it to streaming. Said, no, this is a movie that should be seen in the theaters. I 100% agree. And just held it. And no matter how things looked with the pandemic, when it looked like it was kind of going to be never ending, we're still in the middle of it. So I guess you could say it hasn't ended yet. But things aren't nearly as bad as they were, you know, two and a half years ago now. But specifically holds it for the theater, for the theatrical release, and got bumped two or three times. Because I think it was going to come out at Christmas of 2020. Then I think they were saying like May of 2021, then maybe Christmas of 2021, and it didn't come out to Memorial Day of this year, 2022. And is, I believe, the biggest hit of the year still. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything is going to catch it. Avatar might eventually, but I kind of doubt it. I don't think Avatar is going to get the repeat business that Top Gun got. Every single show that I ran of it was sold out. During, that, during its opening weekend. And then it came back. 
a few months later, sold out every single show for a movie that was three months old at that point. And then I think even some theaters brought it back a third time. Because I think just before the the Christmas movies had opened up, I think uh, the theater that's nearest me had it still. Oh, okay. Or had brought it back and had it on the big screen as well. Not just like in some tiny Cracker Box house, had it in the big screen. So it's made something like 800 mil, like domestically. It's awesome. I loved it. Cruise is very good in it. Not award worthy like some people were saying, but he's very good. Uh, a lot of those aerial scenes are great. I like the new cast. They're a lot of fun. Shout out to my man Jay Ellis from Insecure, mm-hmm. who's a guy that I hope gets bigger roles because I love them on Insecure. Miles Teller. Miles Teller, who everyone seems to hate, but I don't know what the deal is. Like, he seems fine. <laughs> I think maybe I think everyone seems to hate him because I think he came off as a douchebag like in an interview however many years ago. Don't really care. He seems like a good he seems like a good actor. Yeah, I mean for, as, <laughs> like did everyone forget about Whiplash? I guess. That's me moving to my chair. That's not me farting. I just want to tell all your listeners on air. That's just me moving in the chair. <laughs> 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 but Good movie. I like that it, it does pay homage to Tony Scott, uh, especially in the beginning and the end, the end credits. Really like the Lady Gaga tune. I think the Lady Gaga tune's good. You like it? Yeah, hold my hand. I think it's a good song. I think it plays well over the end. Uh, the end credits were like showing the cast members. Mm-hmm. We talked about uh, the Sherman Showcase, uh, Bashir um, uh, Suhaiden. I hope I'm saying that right. Is Hondo? He's he's Cruz's buddy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I want to shout him out because he's actually in Top Gun, the biggest movie of the year. And I almost didn't recognize him at first because in Sherman Showcase he has like the like the afro and the beard and everything. And when I was watching the movie, I was like, "Wait, is that is that the dude from Sherman Showcase?" <laughs> and then at the end, I was like, "Oh, it is." I just didn't recognize him because he didn't have the afro and the beard and everything. But I. I I highly recommend it. I was surprised at how much I enjoyed it. I thought, oh, you know, a a legacy sequel. I don't know. Sometimes those aren't the best, even though Blade Runner 2049 is incredible. But, I mean, then you have, like, The Matrix Resurrections, which you and I were kind of on last year. There's half of a good movie there, right? (laughs) Um so I was I was pleasantly surprised. Top Gun is a, like a big movie for me because I saw it at exactly the right age. Okay. And love it. Still love it to this day. I know it's not a great movie. Like a lot of Tony Scott movies, it's just kind of there. <laughs> Where it's not really bad, but it's not really great either. But because I saw it at the right age, always have like this this real strong connection to it. Know it by heart. If it's on, I'll leave it on while I'm doing stuff around the house. So I was I was kind of a little a little skeptical that it would be as good, and really fucking enjoyed it. And the IMAX scenes again are awesome. This one is a movie I don't think did well at all because I think it's gone already, or it's down to like one show, and that's Empire of Light. Oh, okay. The Sam Mendes movie. Yeah. Which, it's not like a perfect film. I I still had a couple of issues with it, but you know me, coming from a movie theater background, working in the movie theater for so many years, like the whole movie theater aspect, like really got, really got me like, you know, that, uh, that sense of nostalgia and uh, me remembering everything and... Uh, Toby Jones is great. He's the projectionist in the in the theater, mm-hmm. and he's got you know a couple of good kind of semi monologues on film and you know what makes film so special. And then uh, uh, Michael Ward as the uh, the new guy that comes in, and Olivia Coleman is fantastic in the film. Uh, she's been great in. The last few movies she's been in, she's really fucking good in this. Uh, I don't want to say too much because I know you haven't seen it. 
it sounds like no one's watching this movie, so maybe I could spoil it, and no one would care. When uh, when did this come out? Just a couple weeks ago. And it's gone. I think it, I think it opened up the weekend of the 9th, because that's when I saw it. Uh-huh. And even at the Hillcrest where I saw it, it only has it down to one show now. And he's coming, this is his follow-up to 1917? Mm-hmm. And the, the Roger Deakins cinematography is so beautiful in the film. There's a scene on New Year's, New Year's Eve where they're on the roof of the theater watching the fireworks, and it's gorgeous. I haven't really seen much marketing for this. No. And I even even when I asked you, like you had you said you hadn't seen the trailer. And I told you to watch watch the teaser trailer. Well, so why is that? If he's coming off of something that was very uh, I don't know, like yeah. An award winning film. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think maybe it was just a little smaller, a little more personal. I I think that Olivia Coleman's role overshadows Michael Ward's role mm-hmm. in it, unfortunately, mm-hmm. even though, you know, the two of them connect and uh, form this bond in the film. Uh, so it, it kind of feels like his character is maybe a little underdeveloped. But again, maybe people don't like it. Me coming from the movie theater, like it, it hit a lot of those those points with me where I'm just so happy to see a film that's set in the movie theater for the most part. Just, it's it's a lot of nostalgia for me. But, I told you, uh, the second great score of the year from Reznor and Ross is this one. That's which right. Which sounds like a very classical score. Uh, I was surprised it's definitely going to be one I'm going to pick up. Because I thought it was incredible. So, probably won't get a chance to see it now. But do get do watch it whenever you can whenever it comes to streaming here in a little bit all right let me know what you think and then i have one more uh the fablemans oh okay the steven spielberg movie um one i was really looking forward to this and bones and all were like the two this fall that i really really wanted to see badly and uh made it a point to to make the time to see them Mm -hmm. uh Really enjoyed it. At least come the second half of the movie. The first half, like I had my issues with, because it seems like there's more melodrama in the first half, and for some reason it just didn't sit right Mm -hmm. with me. Yeah, I was just getting annoyed by it. Um, It's autobiographical, you know, about kind of him, Spielberg's life coming up and. You know, I know that he is a child of divorce and had like kind of a weird situation with his parents and everything. And that's depicted in the film. And Michelle Williams and, and Paul Dano are both very, very good in the movie. As is Seth Rogen, like, like who very, who underplays his uh, comedic persona. <laughs> it is more of a dramatic role for him and really fucking good in it. And there's. Like I said, there's some over-the-top melodrama in the earlier half of the film. So I was kind of on the fence about it. But once the second half comes around, and especially when he's a teenager and he gets moved from Arizona to Northern California and is dealing with trying to fit in as being probably one of the very few Jewish students in, in you know a high school. Uh, and then getting the chance to kind of see him. You see, it, you see it in a couple of scenes before. Where he, he's directing his, his films, you know, making his, his uh, uh, films when he's still a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get to see some really great scenes pay off. You know, one of them is an homage to one of his, one of, like a war film that he made when he was a child. Like a Super 8 war film. That when you're seeing this movie being made in, in the context of this film, is really impressive. And he's got a really good scene where even though he's young, you can see him becoming a director not only in his camera work and his visuals but also dealing with actors and getting them to the point that they need to be for their performance Mm -hmm. Uh, really really fantastic and then like the latter half of the movie which I think is much much stronger is where it really like sunk in for me where I was like okay now I'm like totally on board with it I'm enjoying it a lot. 
Uh, there's still like one or two scenes that might be a little over, overly melodramatic. But uh, not nearly as bad as the first half, which was just annoying. And I'll probably need to give it a second watch to see if if that first half still bugs me the way that it does. But uh, like I said, Dano Williams both give fantastic performances playing versions of his parents. Um, the kind of like the climax of the film is really fucking good with him making a film like in school uh, I don't want to spoil that but seeing him construct the film and then having conversations with people afterwards was so wonderful and I another one of what I would consider like some of my favorite moments on, on film this year Okay, I'm not going to spoil Anything, I spoiled this a long time ago when this casting was announced. I'm watching the movie, and I'm waiting, because the movie's long. It's about two and a half hours without trailers. Which, by the way, there was like fucking 20 trailers in front of the whale yesterday morning. I was like, there must have been eight or nine trailers before the whale started. I think it was like that for me, too. AMC is, is nuts. It's like 25 minutes before the actual movie starts. Anyways, uh... Um, the movie's long I'm watching and I'm thinking about halfway through I'm like wait like David Lynch is supposed to be in this and then he pops up and without spoiling anything I would say that the David Lynch cameo might be like my favorite single moment in any movie this year okay it's so fucking good it's so fucking funny I, I just don't want to say anything else about it. Even Joel, when I was like, dude, the David Lynch cameo is fucking brilliant. I was like, oh, wait, he's in it? Don't tell me anything else. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, I won't. I won't spoil it because it is really great casting. And he's so good in it. And I kept wondering, like, how do those two know each other? Because that just seems like a very odd pairing. And then I found out that they didn't know each other. That uh, Laura Dern kind of hooked him up. Because she's had worked with Spielberg on Jurassic Park and she's been uh, Lynch's muse for... Oh yeah, that's right. 40 years almost. 35, 40 years. And he's worked with her in a handful of of projects. So apparently she introduced them and hooked them up and uh, I'm glad that she did because again, the David Lynch cameo in the film is uh, so inspired. And I had the biggest shit inning grin on my face throughout all of it (laughs) because i was so happy that he came on and i'm such a big uh, fan of his and then like the last shot of the movie is a visual joke that gets talked about earlier on in the film so really pay attention during that last that final shot of the film okay because it's another really big laugh if you've been paying attention uh, so I, I would highly recommend it. Like I said, I had my issues with it. Maybe I just need a second watch because reading a lot of the reviews and even listening to the blank check episode that they did on it because they covered Spielberg before. So whenever a director comes out with a new movie, mm-hmm. they'll go back and cover that movie. Even uh, listening to their episode, they were all in on it and talked about how much they loved it. And then I kind of thought about it some more. and I was like, okay, maybe I just need a second watch and see if that... That first half still bugs me uh, the way it did. Another movie where I'm like the only guy in the theater. And then like 10 minutes in, some other dude wanders in. And I believe orders DoorDash like into the theater. You can do that? I don't think so, but because it's like so... There's no one around because it's a late show. Uh, I think he just wandered out, picked up the food from the delivery driver, came in because then he's got this big gigantic bag. And he's eating... And then he gets up and, like, leaves again. <laughs> what? And then comes back. And then afterwards is like, what did you think of the movie? Like, he's yelling at me from, like, the bottom of the theater. I sit in the top corner, for those who don't know. Uh, because it's like the don't fuck with me seats. And what did you say? I was like, yeah, I was like, it's great. But the second half is, my opinion, stronger than the first half. Because I couldn't get past the, the overly melodramatic stuff in the first half. Maybe I just need that second watch, but I highly recommend it. It's really great. 
Uh, kind of unfortunate because I believe that's the last John Williams score for a Spielberg movie. And the score is very low key, uh, kind of melancholy. Mm-hmm. It's one I'm going to have to listen to isolated. Uh, it's not, you know, as as bombastic as his other Spielberg scores are. But it was kind of sad thinking about that because I know that the Indiana Jones movie is going to be his last final uh, film that he scores, but I think this was the final Spielberg movie that he was going to score. So I want to go back and listen to it by itself. Hopefully that indie movie's good, man. It's James Mangold, but to to retire on that movie and then if it's bad here's my thing the trailer does not do it for me because the cgi stuff okay there's like cgi action scenes Mm -hmm. and i just can't get into it because watching raiders of the lost ark and the last crusade and temple of doom and seeing like actual stunts being performed on a set or out in you know out in uh wherever they're shooting do you think that any of that will be cleaned up and, and made to look better. It's possible, but still, it's CGI stunts with like green screen instead of being on location somewhere and shooting. So, yeah, I'll watch it because it's mangled. It's an Indiana Jones movie, but just the trailer. I was already man. This this doesn't look great. Your bar your bar is kind of low. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but like I said. There's, it's got some good things going for it, and I'd be really excited to hear uh, the final John Williams score. So the Fablemans. Check out the Fablemans. And the... Um, it's for Universal. He made it for Universal, which was his original home. Uh, is where he got to start was with Universal, and they, they made Jaws and Sugar Land Express, and I think Duel was even set up at Universal, even though it was a TV film. Um Obviously, he's had big success later on with like Jurassic Park and Schindler's List were, were both universal. But it has the universal logo and then the M1 logo, which is, you know, the E.T. E.T. bike. But it like goes from like the universal logo straight to the M1 logo. Like all of a sudden you see like the, the bike from E.T. like right across the screen without going to a separate uh, production card. Mm-hmm. It's really it's really cool. I dug it, but yes, the Fablemans. Check it out. I don't know where it ranks. If I had to rank them, it might be a top five. Looking at my list, is that streaming anywhere? I don't think so. Not yet. As of yet. But okay. when it does, I would expect it to go to Peacock because it's Universal. Okay. I don't know what the window for Universal films is that came out around Thanksgiving as well. Uh, but I would say probably within the next month or two, you'd probably see it pop up. Real quick, since you brought up the menu, have you have you watched um, the bear yet? Do you the know the bear's it? great? Yeah, I loved it. Holy shit, loved it. And uh, I was thinking of my friend because Joel's brother used to work in the kitchen, used to be a, a chef and mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. And so when I was watching, I was like, oh man, he would really dig this because he knows exactly what that situation and what that environment is like. Mm-hmm. And when I talked to him, he was like, oh, yeah, man, it's great. That's a great show. I said, yeah, absolutely. Great show. I just wanted to make sure I give a shout out to the bear. Yes. Also, have you seen um, the Indian film uh, RRR? Yet? No, but I've heard a lot of good things about it. Ryan is a huge champion of this film. He says that it's he. He wanted me to bring it up on the show, and ma- he 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 said make sure that you say RRR is leaps and bounds better than Avatar, <laughs> and that Avatar sucks. So he has watched the way of water. No, he refuses. He to. refuses. Okay, so he's like me. He yeah. just, I'm not going to waste my time with it. Unless he secretly watched it, I doubt it, because he really hates James Cameron even more than us, probably. What? Like all of his movies? No, of, he's he respects the classics, <coughs> but he he just doesn't like James Cameron as a person. As a person, okay. I mean, I can get it. He's he's got kind of a prickly uh, persona. I get that, but I mean, damn, dude! Like the Terminator and Aliens and the Abyss, pretty fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. Can't argue with you there. Yeah. 
I'm guilty of not checking it out yet. I believe it's on Netflix. Yeah, I think so. Streaming. Um, crazy. Two and a half hours. I hear a lot of good things about it, and uh, we'll be checking it out. Cool. So shout out to our own Ryan Jimenez. Sorry you couldn't make it. Hope you were feeling better. Yeah. Yeah, but, it's too bad. I was looking forward to meeting him. We will. Uh, there's always next time. No. Uh. But on his recommendation, because you vouch for him, I'll check it out. Yes. Also, um, any final thoughts? Anything? Any? Those are the best uh-huh. that I have. Okay. We got a little bit of time. Why don't we get into uh, some of the movies that just didn't work? Yeah, why not? For us. Uh, we talked about it a couple months ago off air, but... Let's talk about Halloween ends. Oh yeah. Now I, I have a I have a personal question for you. Sure. Did you think that that was going to be on my list of the best? No. No. No, because of our previous discussion a okay. couple months ago. Okay. I knew that you're like, yeah, it's it's not great. It is better than mm-hmm. Halloween Kills. Yeah. Uh, there was some decent stuff in it. Uh, the, some of the big problems I had with it was how did Corey become a killer all of a sudden? It's like, it's like Michael, he runs into Michael Myers in the sewer and then kind of mind melds with him. And then all of a sudden he's a, he's a killer. It was, that was kind of weird. I didn't really get what was going on there. It was like, it seemed like they were trying to do some trauma bonding because so Michael Myers had disappeared for four, four years or whatever, you know? Um, so they think that he's gone or dead, whatever. And then Corey ends up having this, we won't spoil it what it is, but a a fucked up accident happens in town and he's now the kind of new monster of Haddonfield. Yeah. That cold open is, is wild. Yeah. Probably the best, maybe the best thing about the movie. Yeah. Um, and so he becomes the new kind of face or the villain of Haddonfield. Right. And, um, he he ends up being attacked or bullied by this kind of group of high school kids, even though it's like, yeah, I feel like he could easily fuck them up. I know it's kind of funny. Yeah, he's, he's much older and bigger, but also it, he's he's very timid. Yeah, he's a very sh- yeah. shy person. But anyway, they end up throwing him over this bridge and then he kind of gets abducted by Michael. And that's where it gets confusing is where there's some kind of bonding that happens with them. And, and then... It's like Corey is like the kind of copycat killer, which is, and I would have bought that if he was just like a straight copycat. Uh-huh. But it was like that weird moment in the sewer. Yeah, almost like it's like a fucking Where like, like Michael's like looking into his past or something. Yeah, like he knows that he's went through something similar mm-hmm. and changes him, but they don't ever ref- really reference it. We're just supposed to, you know, take from that whatever we will. But it's almost like. This kind of weird, like, tag team. Yeah. They become a team without saying anything, and we're just supposed to. As, um, as, how do you say, as, um, watchers, we are just supposed to buy this. Mm-hmm. But I really, I, ha- I had a lot of fun with Jamie Lee Curtis in this one because she's finally, even though she's lost her daughter, Karen, in the, at the end of the kills, you know, we've, we're meeting up with her four years into the future so she has a lot of time to kind of she's you can tell she's trying to become herself again and and she's not like this hardened fucking lady battle angel Mm -hmm. that just has like fucking you know all this stuff rigged to to fight michael she thinks that everything's done essentially and um and she's even trying to like celebrate halloween again and like these little details were fun um, for me, and I felt like uh, Jamie did a really good job. She's good. It bugged me that Will Patton got shortchanged in the film big time because it seems like in Halloween Kills they set up like a real like they have a bond, mm-hmm. you know, and almost almost like kind of some romantic chemistry too. Yeah, and they're hanging out like you said, they're hanging out in the hospital together, and they don't have a lot to do, so you're. Uh, and any natural person who watches a lot of film is like, oh, they're building us up mm-hmm. for the next film when they're better and they can 
you know, be mobile again. And then Will Patton comes back as uh, Sheriff Hawkins and they give him absolutely nothing to do. Yeah. He is the kind of love interest for Lori and even that is like very lightly touched upon. Yeah. Yeah, he's only in a couple of scenes. Which is kind of like, what? He doesn't even get to like battle Michael at all. Again. Yeah, like, and then almost, it was almost like they were just acquaintances again. And I'm wondering, like, did nothing happen in those four years? Why? Yeah, why? Yeah. Or, <laughs> or even, even if something, you know, if they did have a relationship and it just ended, you know, it's almost like none of that was non-existent. Like, they're, they barely know each other in this movie. And that was a bummer for me because I thought that he was really great in uh, both Halloween films, but especially in Kills when they're in the hospital. Um, uh, what else was bugging me? Some of, some of the the kills are great. The the whole the the uh, junkyard. Oh yeah, kills are really great. Uh, but also, like you you said. They spoiled that whole climactic fight between the two of them in that trailer. Yeah, so the whole trilogy is building towards this, you know, Laurie is going to finally take out Michael. And the way that they executed that final fight in the kitchen, I had no problem with it. I thought it was fun. It was good. Um, You know, they beat each other's ass. But that first trailer that they came out with for Halloween Ends... Is just that fight. Yeah. And so if that's all you had up your sleeve in your back pocket, why are you giving away your hand so early on, you know? And that's why I think that people made the movie out to be worse than it really was because there was no... They ruined the mystery. Yeah. As far as that final fight between them. Had had there been... Maybe that was the first fight and then there was a mystery Mm -hmm. fight at the, you know that we hadn't seen before maybe it would work out better um but they do do the thing where they make it to where michael cannot be brought back yeah which is cool because the film is called halloween ends and i heard a lot of (laughs) shit talking about yeah well it's not going to be actually be over but they they shut everybody up in that front (laughs) there's definitely no way he's coming back (laughs) from that And I, I had a really hard time buying the end of, of kills where I'm like, you can't get beaten and shot and stabbed that many times and be like, yeah, I'm cool still. Yeah. So this one is not coming back. Also, uh, the name escapes me right now. The granddaughter's name? Allison. Allison. Okay. And the other thing that really bugged me was like Allison kind of starts this relationship with Corey. And it's only supposed to be like when the movie starts, it's only a few days before Halloween, three or four days tops. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden she has this like whirlwind romance with Corey and she's like ready to run away with him. She doesn't, she stops caring about anybody. I'm thinking like, you barely know this dude and he's kind of like Red Flag City. Yeah. (laughs) I mean... uh... Do you maybe, th- maybe she's messed up. Maybe, you know. That's what I gathered okay. is that she was just not really. She's She lost both her parents to, to mm-hmm. Michael Myers. Mm-hmm. You know, saw lots of death and, and trauma from people that she know besides her parents that had been killed. But, yeah, she, she like, jumps into this, like, full bore right away and is all, like, ready to run away with, with Corey, who definitely has issues that probably need to be addressed first so i didn't i didn't buy that that was something that that had bugged me throughout the film uh the credits were the best part yeah little uh homage to uh season of the witch season of the witch and then like with the with the pumpkins constantly like a like a uh nesting doll Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh that was really cool what's something else that didn't work for you something that you saw that maybe you didn't like or maybe liked aspects of but not as a whole here's sure. my thoughts on amsterdam which has a stacked cast mm-hmm. which is a david o russell movie who i know is a very polarizing director but i've really enjoyed a lot of his films uh was kind of excited for that to me it looked like a coen brothers movie 
from the trailer, the way everything is set up. And that's a detriment to it. Because when I was watching it, I was like, oh, this is trying to be a Coen Brothers movie without it having the magic of the Coen Brothers. And it's really disappointing. It's a little overlong because it's like 2.15, 2 hours, 15 minutes. But I told you, it's like what, what Joel had said about Bad Times at the El Royale, where it's like, oh, that's trying to be a Tarantino movie without really having the magic of the Tarantino. Mm-hmm. And that's what Amsterdam felt like to me is, oh, it's got this incredible cast and it can't hold a candle to any of the Coen Brothers movies, which it's seemingly trying to, to act like. It does have a very good fake out at the end, which I won't spoil, but uh, Anya Taylor-Joy and Rami Malek are, uh, have a really good fake out. Well, here's a tough one. What do you think about Black Panther? Black Panther is, I feel like they did the best that they could with the circumstances. It's unfortunate. Because I think that if Bozeman had been alive and that had been a true Black Panther movie, Mm -hmm. it probably would have been a lot better than Mm -hmm. it was. Mm -hmm. It's got some great stuff in it. I mean, Angela Bassett's my lifelong crush for a reason. Mm -hmm. For a reason, she is incredible in her scenes in it. Um... And um, Tena Corta, who plays Namor, I think was the best part of the film, besides Angela Bassett, of course. Uh, I think all the Namor stuff is is really awesome. Yeah, he's really good. A good anti-hero. Yeah. But any of the stuff that really wasn't about uh, him and his people beyond the Angela Bassett stuff, I was like very much, eh. Do you didn't like uh, Cherie? Her She's bitch? okay. She just doesn't. She was great in the first one. But for some reason, this one, and maybe it's the circumstances, and maybe it's how her character is supposed to be because she's in mourning. She, to me, she just didn't have the charisma that she, she had in the first one and definitely has nowhere near the charisma that Bozeman had. Okay. So the shift, would, the shift in the, her being the main character was hard for you. Yeah, and I realize that they're doing the best that they can because that wasn't something that got planned. I'm yeah. really curious to see the movie that would have been. I don't think that uh, the Namor stuff was any different. I think that was always going to be that way and end that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what movie did they have planned before his death? Like I said, it's it's tough because... I can't say that I didn't enjoy it because I very much enjoyed certain aspects of it, but I probably would have enjoyed it much more if it was Bozeman as Black Panther. One, uh, something that I did, I really enjoyed, um, but I wouldn't, I don't think it was like my favorite, but uh, Barbarian. Barbarian was good. It's a lot of fun. I I liked that. I was very surprised that it was from one of the whitest kids you know. (laughs) I was uh, shocked when I when I saw that. I liked it. I think I told you before. I think it had been a little built up mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for me. So while I enjoyed it, I was expecting to have my mind blown. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't quite that mm-hmm. for me. So I think that that was a bit of a where the disappointment came in for me. I feel like, and maybe you could stop me if I'm wrong, but for me at least, I felt like I went to, into it thinking it was going to be a different high concept. Mm-hmm. And it really wasn't that. Um, granted, the performances carry it through, and a lot of theirs, um, the, the big secret of the film is not really explained at all, which I think... Um, does kind of give it uh, its edge Mm -hmm. um and i did i think i think i read that they don't want to do like a prequel or whatever no please god don't yeah don't there's no need for it (laughs) you you see you see what happens in that chunk in the middle of the movie Mm -hmm. you see how things become the way that they do that's all you need i don't need a prequel but I did like that it's like one movie for about 45 minutes and then it takes a complete swerve. And you're like, okay. <laughs> and then it's like a different movie for like another 30, 40 minutes. 
however long it is, I might I might be over exaggerating on the, the runtime of that first section of the movie. But it does that swerve, and it's like a totally different movie for you know another big chunk of runtime. And then those two storylines finally converge, and it's great. Uh, Justin Long is so good in the movie. Um, who's the girl? The first ch- chunk of the film with Georgina Campbell and Bill Skarsgård is really fucking good. Uh, I like I enjoyed it a lot more than the Justin Long stuff. Not that the Justin Long stuff is bad, but he's just like so douchey. Uh, but that first chunk of the movie with them not really knowing each other or what's going on, and you know she is obviously a little skeptical about him. Uh, but he's you know inviting her in and saying, hey, you know you can stay here, you sleep here, mm-hmm. and everything, everything is okay. I'll be in here. And then having what happens happen. It, it was really good. I was I was shocked. And Georgina Campbell carries it the rest of the way in when she does pop up again. Because the Skarsgård is kind of like the red herring. Where yeah. you think that yeah. he's in on something. He's part of it. And he's really not. Yeah. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good movie. It's fun. It's and lot. it gets very claustrophobic mm-hmm. in, uh, in a couple of scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. Really enjoyed it. Again, a bit disappointed just because it had been built up, or from what I had heard. I watched it. Really enjoyed it. Just I wasn't as blown away as I hoped I would have been by it. The monsters. <laughs> Fuck Rob Zombie. <laughs> yeah. That's what I have to say. <laughs> oh man, I sat through it because I think they they brought it to it came out on Netflix. And then there's physical, it has a physical release as well. But I watched it on Netflix and I was just didn't care. Just seeing the trailer, there was something like off about the way that it was shot and the way that it looked. Like yeah. it looked like it was shot on video for video. Yeah, like bad. Yeah. Like, 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 like he, they didn't get financing. Yeah. Like cheap. Did, did someone shoot it like on a handy cam or something? <laughs> That's what it looks like. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, you could say what you want, but The Devil's Rejects did not look like that. No, like, that yeah. actually looked like a movie. Yeah. I don't like that movie, uh-huh. but it looked like it was shot on film. <laughs> yeah. And that Monsters thing looked like looked like a bad commercial you would see, like, in the mid-90s for toys or something. It, was, it had that look to it. And then there's a lot of people defending it saying well you know if if you're not into this then you don't understand his style and what he does and have you watched any other of his movies and i'm like dude yeah i have and it just doesn't there's something wrong like it just looks off like you said it doesn't make any sense here's another problem stop trying to force your wife into all of your movies dude she's not good (laughs) Especially with what she was trying to do in this. <laughs> Maybe she's a lovely person in real life. I could be wrong. She's a terrible actress. Stop putting her in your movies. <laughs> Not that I would go and watch any of your movies, but still. I have a point counterpoint for you. Ambulance. Not as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's pretty solid for the first two acts. I apologize if that's how... I, my review came off. <laughs> Maybe it's my hate for, what's his name, Michael Bay. Um, You're going to get no argument from me. Um, like, the movie's okay, but there's just some things that don't that uh, that could have been better. For at least the first two acts, I was probably having as much fun watching a Michael Bay movie as I've had since The Rock. Because a lot of his other movies are such a fucking slog. Mm-hmm. I granted I've only seen one Transformers movie and I refuse to watch any of the others. Mm-hmm. But I was like, whoa, like I'm actually enjoying this. And the 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 bank heist and escape is really good. Uh and then it the second act is pretty solid. I was disappointed that Aza Gonzalez doesn't really have a whole lot to do in the movie. I thought she deserved better. 
Uh, but overall, like Joan Hall, like uh, Yaya uh, Abdul Mateen. Fucking good. He's really good in it. He's probably the best part of that film. Uh, and then the third act happens, and in typical Michael Bay fashion, it goes for like a half hour too long and is completely fucking bonkers. I was really like surprised that I was having a good time, and then that last act hit, and I'm like, this is fucking dumb. <laughs> Damn it. I was hoping that this would be like the first solid Michael Bay movie in 20 years, 25 years, however long it's been. But you, you had sent me that and you're like, yeah, Ambulance isn't that good. And then I watched it like a few days later. And I was like, honestly, like I didn't think it was that bad because those first two acts are pretty solid. That first, the like I said, the everything like leading up to and through the bank heist is really good, really exciting. And then it just gets dumber and dumber and dumber. Pretty okay with the original Bad Boys. Love The Rock. Armageddon is pretty dumb, but has a couple of fun stuff, fun things going on in it, and anything else past that is trash. Don't waste your time. But at least watch like the first hour or so of Ambulance. Like Bullet Train. I thought Bullet Train could have been a lot better. I was really hoping that it would be. Some of it's pretty fun. The Aaron Johnson and Brian Tyree Henry scenes are great. They have such great chemistry with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoyed that. I was bummed that Zazie Beetz is only in it for like a cameo, basically, because mm -hmm. I really love her. And, you know, shout out to Atlanta. I finally did the full rewatch of Atlanta. And I'm so stoked that I got introduced to like Lakeith Stanfield and Zazie Beetz and Brian Tyree Henry through that show because. I love every single one of them. Every movie that they're in, I'm trying to catch. Or every TV show or movie that they're in, I'm, I'm watching. And even like when they get lost like in a bigger movie, uh, I'm still like excited to see them on screen. But I, I thought that Bullet Train was just okay. It goes on too long. And was bummed at certain aspects. But the Brian Tyree Henry and Aaron Johnson scenes are, are really fun. They had such great chemistry with each other. I think that's what I had told you before you watched it. That that they like their interactions together, their dialogue mm -hmm. is very fun, and they're probably the best part yeah, of the. A hundred percent agree. Well, I want to drop a teaser on what we have coming up for next year, and uh -huh. then I'll specifically drop a teaser for what we have coming up in January. Okay. You and I sat down last week. We came up with the schedule. Mm -hmm. For uh, what we're going to do, we have our 12 movies picked. Uh, can't say anything else on possible bonus episodes that might pop up, pop up along the way. But I think we got some really solid movies in there. We got a, a handful of movies that I think are very small and underappreciated. Which you and I swing the pendulum from either small and underappreciated or big movies that mean a lot to the both of us. And we we start off the year pretty strong with, I think, four four straight, like, pretty underrated movies that have incredible lead performances in them. Um, gonna have a big, a big movie that's one of my all-time favorite movies. Might be one of my top three favorite movies of all time uh, coming up. I'm happy to announce that we got the second summer of sci-fi. Coming up, we've got some good movies in there. A couple of uh, of bigger films. Uh, one definite, a definite blockbuster film. One that I think is uh, pretty critically acclaimed. I don't know what the box office was on that, but an incredible sci-fi movie. And then uh, we got a, a cult, a cult favorite sci-fi film. Coming up, we're gonna have a. Uh, we're going to end the, the year strong with some, some really good heavy-hitting uh, movies from some, some real heavy-hitter directors. Uh, going to have a, a movie from a, a director that you and I surprisingly haven't covered, shockingly haven't covered on this podcast yet. Not yet. Uh, I know that you've covered a couple other films uh, with James uh, way back when. But surprising, 
and shocking that we haven't covered this director. Even even one of the other films, one of my favorite movies. Uh, kind of a shame we haven't covered that director. Uh, got a masterpiece crime film that uh, is is an incredible movie that I think did pretty well, but I don't think well enough where it's become beloved and super well known. Got a good Halloween movie in there, one of the classics. And we're going to end the year with a movie that I think was kind of mixed on its release, but I think now has kind of gotten a, a more more appraisal as it's gotten older. Going to be our Christmas film. I won't say much other than that. But we got we got a really solid lineup coming up for you guys in 2023. And we're going to start the year off with a super underrated movie um, that has just this phenomenal lead performance from an actress who did get mentioned at some point during the show tonight. But a movie that you and I both think is really underrated, a razor-sharp black comedy. I'm excited to talk about it. Because I don't think a lot of people have seen this movie. Even Joel, when I asked him, hadn't seen it. And it's got a great cameo from a director that was mentioned on the show tonight as well. Kind of in passing, but a really fun cameo from, from him. Very nice, man. We got a lot of stuff, great stuff coming up for everybody. I agree. I think we, I think we have a really great lineup of films coming up that we'll be talking about next year. And like I said, we're going to start the year off with like about four months straight of some really underrated films. So I hope that you guys will get a chance to watch them. And a movie that you haven't seen in one of uh, one of those. That's true. That's true. I always like to have one movie that you haven't seen because it's always it's always fun to to get together and talk with you about that and get your first impressions of a film. Absolutely. And uh, if you're listen if your listeners know anything about me by now, there's definitely going to be a couple movies from 1995 on that list. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. This was a lot of fun as usual. Best uh, of 2022. Right? Another one in the books. Cool. Oh man. Like I said, this is the sixth time that we've done this. Wow. Pretty nuts, right? Yeah. Um, as always, thank you for making time for us, for the show. As always, thank you for having me, man. Uh, you and I always uh, do really great work on air. Yeah. I feel. Yeah. And uh, certain episodes during the year, I always look forward to Christmas being one, the year-end episode being the other. Uh, these never disappoint. Thank you, uh, Chris. And thank you, everyone out there, for listening. Uh, Like we usually say, check us out on our social media platforms. We have an Instagram. It's at dropthemic underscore podcast. Or if you are more on the Twitter side of things, you can check us out at at dropthemicpod altogether, obviously. Um, And support the show. Check us out on all major podcast platforms, whether it be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, Sodes, Luminary, Amazon, uh, wherever they play podcasts, we are available. So check us out. Give us some, you know, five star ratings, a little nice uh, small review. Uh, It helps us keep going and helps the show stay relevant, if that makes sense, in the algorithm. Uh, so yeah. Oh, also, happy New Year's, everybody. Have a happy, safe New Year's. Be safe, everybody. Yeah. With whatever you choose to do. Uh, with that being said, until next week, everybody. This is Chris Pollock, Wesley Swanson, signing off, saying good fight and good night. Take care, everyone.